Hey, everybody. I have a couple of announcements to make that I think a lot of you will want to hear. First of all, you have to check out what's going on at Renegade University right now. Uh, we have some webinars coming up that I think most of our listeners will really be interested in. First of all, uh, with James Lindsay, I am co-teaching a course in January called Postmodernism, Critical Theory, and American Politics. Uh, we already have had many people sign up for this course, and we might have to cap it pretty soon. So go to renegadeuniversity.com and sign up if you're interested in that course. It'll be a three-week webinar, uh, the first three Tuesdays in January uh, at 5.30 p.m. Pacific, 8.30 Eastern. So again, it's it's filling up fast, and we will have to we will have to put a limit on it eventually. So please go get those tickets if you're interested. The other one that I think also will probably sell out, uh, we just put up on sale. Um, I'm going to be a student in it because I'm so excited by it. I wish we had had courses like this when I was in college, and this is actually one of the reasons I started Renegade University is to have courses like this. Um, taught by Kamasi Hill who just recently co-taught with me, Talking Shit, The History of African-American Culture, which was an amazing success, uh, just a tremendous time had by all. It was so successful, so popular, that we decided to do a whole spin-off series. So there will be Talking Shit sub-series uh, taught by Kamasi and or me. Uh, the first one is on the history of hip-hop. Kamasi will be teaching this one. It'll be meeting over three weeks, beginning in late January, uh, January 26th, February 2nd, February 9th, same times, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 Pacific. Uh, for those of you who haven't taken Talking Shit yet uh, or haven't seen Kamasi on Are You Live or on Unregistered, um, you'll he is just uh, bar none the greatest teacher of the history of American pop culture I've ever come across, and that's why I hired him to do this job. Um, he's phenomenal. So... Go to renegadeuniversity.com. Uh, look for those two webinars coming up. I'm sure, like as I said, many of you will want to will be interested in those and sign up as soon as you can because we will be putting limits on them. Uh, we don't want to have too many people because we want to enable there to be uh, a lot of conversation. So go do that. Uh, the second announcement, very important. If you're in the Seattle area on December 5th, I will be giving the keynote speech at the Libertarian Party of King County annual holiday party. It's at six o'clock on that Saturday. Go to lpkingcounty.com to get more information and to get your tickets, and I hope to see you there. All right, let's start the show. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. My guest this week is a professor of philosophy at the State University of New York at Fredonia. He's the author of nine books, all of which would make your grandmother freak right out. He has argued that we shouldn't be grateful for our veterans, that the pro-life movement, if it were logically consistent, would be killing lots of people every day. He has argued against morality and responsibility and in defense of adult-child sexual relationships. He's a man after my own heart. And this is my interview with Stephen Kirshner. I am joined from Fredonia, New York by I think possibly the most renegade philosophy professor in the country, maybe in the world, 
A guy I discovered a while ago, I didn't tell you this, Steve, but uh, someone, I think a philosophy professor told me that I should have you on my show because he is so unregistered and so renegade. <laughs> He's perfect. And he says all these wild things. And I said, like, what? Well, here's the title of, of some of his books. And you've written four books, nine books, I'm sorry, nine books. Just four of them are titled um, The Case Against Morality and Responsibility. Abortion, hell, and shooting abortion doctors. Does the pro-life worldview make sense? And we'll get into that argument too. Sure. Then this one, this one you got into quite a bit of heat over, of course. Uh, adult child sex, colon, a philosophical defense, Steve. And then, and then just because you didn't want to, you wanted to make Americans like hate you completely, you, you wrote a book called Gratitude Toward Veterans, colon, a philosophical explanation of why Americans should not be very grateful to veterans. So, you are a philosopher after my own heart in many ways, although I know that you make some arguments that I don't like politically, or I should, I should say are not consistent with my politics, sure. but some that very much are, and even there, they're complicated. Um, these are, you make arguments, the titles tell people right away, these are super provocative, super controversial, but you make the arguments in very academic, scholarly, philosophical terms. Um, you make very rigorous arguments, and so, and some of them will be hard to, to talk to understand for the lay audience and including me, by the way, I, I've taught philosophy, but I don't really have a rigorous formal training in it. And we talked before we, you know, we started this, that you're going to need to present these in layman's terms, but um, it, this is all completely fascinating and relevant in a lot of ways. And I think the audience is going to love it. So why don't we just go through, where do you want to start? Which, which book do you want to defend let's, first? Let's start with the, the abortion book, actually. I think that's Okay, um, cool. Yeah. So what is the argument in your book on abortion? So my argument uh, on the book of abortion is, is that the kind of standard pro-life view is not internally consistent. And I'll just give you a, a few examples. There's kind of like four or five ways you can kind of see it. Right. One is um, that in general, the pro-life forces do not believe that um, women who um, procure an abortion should be uh, convicted of first degree murder for example, um, right. but yet they seem to think that the fetus has the status of a person. It's a little hard to see how you fit those together. Right. They also often argue that it's not okay to assassinate abortion doctors on the way to the abortion clinic. Mm. And yet given their view of the fetus as, as morally equivalent to a child, it's a little hard to see why that would not be the case. I mean, for example, if you had a, a, a Nazi de a death camp, so Auschwitz, and you had one of the executioners, the person who sort of drops in the Zyklon B, the only person can you know, activate it and drop it in, right. on the way to work, it's not clear why it would be wrong to, to execute him. If you can't execute him in the camp, then execute him on the way to camp. And yet, they seem to think, well, it's not okay to assassinate abortion doctors. It's a little hard to see what the inconsistency is. When it comes to, uh, when you link the pro-life view with the religious views, you get odd results in the following way. Um, we often think, for example, that, uh, well, at least the Catholic Church is open to it. And it makes sense that if you thought the fetus was, was a person and you killed the fetus, the fetus would go to heaven, right? Or at the very least, it would not go to hell. And if you allow your fetus to develop into an individual, there's a chance, perhaps a significant chance, that the fetus will develop into a person which will eventually go to hell. It's too big a risk to take. I mean, why would anyone take that risk? You'd never take the risk of your child being brutalized by a gang or dying in a fiery car accident if a bridge was out. And yet the threat here, if you believe these religious tenets, is far greater. I mean, you're risking hell, which is an infinite amount of suffering. It might be as much suffering as direct victimization. It certainly lasts a lot longer. Why would you ever take that risk? There doesn't seem to be an adequate answer to any of these, any of these cases. So it's unclear what, um, you know, whether this view hangs together. I claim that it doesn't. I claim it's inconsistent. And again, you can just see this with like the first degree murder. I'll give you one more example, which is <laughs> that people get very upset when they see someone drinking or smoking, uh, when a pregnant woman drinking or smoking, hmm. saying, look, um, you know, you're going to damage that fetus. Yet they don't get upset. The same people don't get anywhere near upset when they find that someone has aborted their fetus. Well, it's an odd view, right? That it's that it's not okay. It's upsetting <laughs> if you damage your fetus, but if you, you know, on the pro-life account, slaughter yeah. your fetus, that's okay. Well, standardly, slaughtering individuals is worse than maiming the individual. So it's a little hard to see what would explain uh, those attitudes. 
So I claim in all four cases, these attitudes are just inconsistent and, and they do not have a way of escaping it. Whoa. Okay. Dig it. Yes. I like it. Yes. I recently um, reckoned with the fact that I had heretofore not acknowledged, I think because I grew up in ultra liberal, ultra feminist environments, which is that pro-life people, well, maybe you just made an argument against this, but the pro-life people really believe that this thing is murder. You know, the way that, the way that liberals and feminists talk about it, pro-choice people talk about it, the pro-life argument is simply a, um, a front for misogyny. It's like the Trojan horse for some anti-woman agenda, right? That it's really the reason people oppose abortion is because they really hate women. And they want to re restrict the freedom of women. But, you know, I, it occurred to me and I sort of was listening more closely to pro-life people and I, it just dawned on me. It's like, oh my gosh, of course they think it's murder. But then you're right. Um, I noticed that they weren't calling for capital punishment or even putting pr women in prison, right? for right. getting an abortion or doctors for that matter, except for there actually will say this, Kevin Williamson, who's a writer for the national review has been on the show. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure he made the argument that we should at least consider capital punishment for people who get abortion. So that would be consistent, right? Yes. It, it would be that, minus the problem that the heaven and hell problem. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should yeah, also right. mention one other problem they have in addition to the ones I've mentioned. They have a metaphysical problem as well in that when they say, well, why is it right after conception you have the person's present Usually their view is some sort of biological account, an animalist account in particular. They think that it's an organism at that point in time. After conception, you have an organism. Mm -hmm. And then once the organism exists, the person exists. Even though the organism doesn't yet have a brain, there's no consciousness, the organism exists. So you think, okay, all right. So yeah, you're able to follow that. You're like, a person is an organism. And then you say, but, but you believe in heaven and hell. And in heaven and hell, the organism's long gone. In fact, we can see the dead and rotting organism in the grave. Hmm. So how is it that you used an organism view to explain why early abortions are wrong and then you reject it when you, you tell us about your religious views? So, so yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right. So even if they can get around the, the notion that we shouldn't charge women with murder and that we, you know, there, there really is nothing wrong with, with you know, executing abortion doctors, there's still these other problems. Yeah. So are you, I mean, I know this is not the question you're addressing, but it has to be raised in your mind and other people's minds. Does this suggest to you that they don't fully deeply believe what they're saying? Um, so psychologically, I don't think that's the case. I just don't think that their views hang together and they, they don't want to face the fact that they don't oh. they contradict one another. I see. So I, I think they actually do believe it. And, and I think they have, you know, but for these contradictions, the rest of the systems hold together. Uh -huh. It's just that these are fairly troubling contradictions. Well, yeah. So if you, if you take it to its logical co conclusion, I agree with you completely. Pro-life people should be shooting abortion doctors. Right. And right? at the very least, they should say there's nothing wrong with it if others want to do it. Absolutely. Right. right. I mean, look, we wouldn't, we would have no problem if the, um, if in World War II, the Jewish resistance were, were, were assassinating of course. executioners at, at, you know, Dachau or Treblinka. Yeah, of course. These are, but these the numbers are, here are staggering. Yeah, these, are, these are mass murderers we're talking right. about. Right, I mean, we're talking 40 million, you know, <laughs> or more uh, abortions since Roe. I mean, Roe v. Wade. Yeah, I mean, it really had this sort of the, the, the same degree of wrongness as killing an infant. Yeah. It, it, it's hard to see why you wouldn't tolerate violence in others, think it permissible, and think the people who solicited the, 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 the lethal slaughter, um, yeah. slaughter why, why they shouldn't be severely punished. If you believe it's murder, and by the way, I'm agnostic on that, because I don't think you can prove or disprove it, right? You can't ask a fetus. No one's ever asked a fetus what they think about this, and no one's ever like, you know, uh, determined one way or the other that it's murder or not. But, but if you do believe it's murder, I don't think there's a single person in prison anywhere in the world who's killed as many people as your average abortion doctor. Right. I think that's right. And, and even when you look at, the, you know, the, some murder. of the, um, the leading, uh, you know, American serial killers. Yeah. You know, like Gary Ridgway. I mean, he, does, he, hasn't, he hasn't come close to this. Yeah. I, I actually disagree with you. I, I do think there's a right answer to whether or not abortion is permissible, leaving aside the foundational okay. problems. Um, because I think, it's, I think it's the kind of um, sort of Judith Jarvis Thompson argument that it's the woman's body. And mm. therefore, that even if the fetus were a person, it's a case of a, of a, a trespasser. But 
mm. leaving that aside, mm. whether or not whether or not the pro-choice <laughs> argument holds up, the point is the pro-life position has blatant inconsistencies built into it, especially when you combine them with the religious framework that um, from that are that are that often accompany them. We should have millions of women in prison or or executed by the state already as well and all the doctors should absolutely be put to death these are mass murderers and that's what if if you believe it's murder that's powerful i mean right. <laughs> that's that's something that you know i would think pro-choice people should be using against pro-life people often but they don't use that argument no they, they don't and I, I think one of the reasons why is they don't really want to grant the pro-life position that the fetus is a person yeah instead of saying let's grant you your right. position and then go with it Right. So what did you, what, what were you saying about the pro-life? I mean, sorry, the pro-choice position. What are the problems with that? So I, not the, so I think that the, the pro-choice position is true. And, and I okay. think there's sort of two assumptions which underlie it. The first assumption is that the fetus simply does not have a right to be inside the woman. Um, in the case of an unwanted pregnancy, she never granted permission for the fetus to be inside of her. For okay. example, in the case of failed contraception, in the case of rape, even if she did grant the, the, the fetus permission to be inside of her, let's say she got, intentionally got pregnant, mm -hmm. you can withdraw consent, just like you can withdraw consent to sex, you can withdraw consent to someone being in your house, you can withdraw consent to someone being in your body. So in that sense, I think the fetus does not have a right to be inside the woman, at least when the fetus is unwanted. Then the issue arises, and this is where I really think the action is. I, I don't think that there's too strong an argument that the fetus has a right to be inside the woman. I think the real action is whether or not abortion involves too much force. Mm. That is, we normally don't think to get someone out of your apartment that you can use lethal force. Now, my view is because it's a bodily invasion and we can use lethal force to prevent a new or a ongoing bodily invasion, it's not too much force. Right. So I think we can show that's not too much force, but at least we know where the action is, right? Is it too much force? Right. I'll just give an example of why we would think it's, it's not too much force. Um, <laughs> let's say, again, going to use the Nazi example, let's say that you had a, a young woman in one of these Nazi death camps and the Nazi authority said, look, we're going to give you one of two options. You can either um, have you know, sex with one of the, you know, the, the, the officers running the camp or you can carry one of the Nazi couple's child, children for whatever reason they were unable to, to carry the, the um, fetus to term. Right. It seems reasonable, at least some of these women would say, well, look, I'd rather um, have sex then then carry the, the the fetus yet the sex is the moral equivalent of rape and you can use lethal force to right. prevent rape if you can prevent use lethal force to prevent rape and this other thing an un unwanted bodily invasion by a fetus is worse than rape then it follows that you can use lethal force to prevent that mm -hmm. so that's why i don't think it's too much force but at least that's where i think the action is okay Unwanted bodily invasion. My goodness. Yes. So you're comparing you're comparing a fetus to a burglar who breaks into your house. Yes. Or or, or a <laughs> someone who imagine a man having sex with a woman and she says, you know what, I, I agreed to have sex initially, but I've, I've changed my mind, you need to stop. If he goes on for an hour or more, I think she can use lethal force to make him stop. Okay. Even though she had initially granted permission, she can withdraw permission. Right. right? Why? Because it's such a severe trespass upon her rights. And again, it's hard to see why a nine-month unwanted fetus in the woman's body isn't at least a severe trespass as someone who's continued on, a male who continues on with sex even after permission's been withdrawn. Okay. What if it's a wanted pregnancy? So if the wanted pregnancy, then the fetus has a right to be there. If the woman changes her mind, then it's, it's similar to the case in which a woman agrees to have sex with a man and then uh, says... Uh, I, I actually have changed my mind. You know, I withdraw my consent. So then it would be murder then to you if it's a wanted pregnancy that's terminated? So I, I actually don't think, I actually don't think the individual cease, begins to exist until the individual has a brain and perhaps a functioning brain. Okay. But leaving that aside, given the, the pro-life position that the individual starts a conception, I think there it's still, um, it would not be murder unless the woman wants it and someone else were to, were to kill her. Okay. And how has this been received? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I gave the talk at the Society for Christian Philosophers <laughs> in uh, Niagara, at Niagara University, and then again at Minneapolis. Uh. And the general consensus was something like the following. Well, there's something wrong about it. We're not quite sure what it is, but there's something wrong about it. <laughs> um, so that's, 
Well, yeah, they need so. they need to start they need to start locking up people and killing people. That's what that's what's wrong. I mean that <laughs> it's that simple, right? I mean, well, actually, on that issue, so I, I have a number of friends who are pro life, who are excellent philosophers, and I, I asked them. So I asked them individually. Yeah. You know, for my former you know colleague Dale Tug, people like that. So I asked them. Yeah. Um, so what's what's wrong with with shooting and killing abortion doctors? Now, some of them said, well, there's really nothing wrong with it, but it's a bad strategy. Right? It's not gonna, we want to win the hearts and minds of no. the American people, and we're not going to win the hearts and minds. So they're like, yeah, it's just, it's just not a great strategy. And others said, well, you know what? Um, don't quote me on this, but I really can't see what's wrong with it. Yeah, <laughs> of course. So I, I, there was only a couple, um, uh, most notably uh, David Hirschneff at, at the University of Buffalo and, and, and Phil Reed at Canisius, hmm. who said, well, among other things, it's not as great – a wrong as murdering an infant because there is a bodily invasion element. So the bodily invasion element adds a partial but not entire justification to it, mm -hmm. or it's a partial excuse for it. Right. Now, now I don't think this works, but, but at least they had an argument, right? They tried to say, look, it's less of a wrong than murdering an infant. And so they, they, they tried to sort of get around it. And that, <laughs> that was the best response I got. But a lot of my pro-life friends, like I said, were excellent philosophers and, and great people as well. They call it what? They said, well, it's, it's a bad strategy. That's that's weak. That that isn't that's a cop out. Um, but um, yeah, so it's like what are they the the, uh, the people who make the argument are saying that it's sort of like a misdemeanor homicide. Is that what they're saying? Yeah, I mean, what they're saying is it should be a uh, you know like a serious misdemeanor, right, or, or a lesser <laughs> felony than murder, because there is a partial excuse or a partial justification. Mm. It's it's a little hard to see why that is. I mean, it's 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 a little hard to see if there is a justificational element. It's going to be something like there's a bodily invasion and it's a severe invasion. It's mm. a little hard to prevent that from becoming a full fledged justification of abortion. Right. In the excuse, it's hard to see what the excuse feature is present. Right. There's no yeah. impaired thinking. It's not like the woman or the physician you know, has like a provocation or a, you know, a duress or something like that, or at least in some cases, those aren't present. So, so it's hard to see why there would be a broad based excuse. Yeah. So intellectually, we should be, we should admire the people, the pro-life people who did shoot and kill abortion doctors, because at least they know <laughs> who they are, right? They're consistent exactly. yes. intellectually, right? Yeah. No, these are, these are guys who, uh, who put their lives on the line to do what as best they could determine was correct. It's if it's mass murder, Hey, you know, you got to do anything to stop that. Right. That, that's I, right. I mean, yeah, there's very little you can't do. And at the very least, not only are you killing people who are on their way to committing slaughter, but they're fully responsible for doing so to the extent that anyone's responsible for what they do. Yeah. These individuals are doing it right. They, they, uh, they're, they're, they're competent. They know what they're doing. It's voluntary, right? They meet all the, the standard conditions for blameworthiness. I have to say, I mean, I, thinking about it now, and it's such a devastating argument that you make. Um, I, I have to believe it does show that their commitment to this may not be as deep as many of them say it is now. Because, by the way, there have been many pro-life people who have shot and killed abortion doctors, right? There ha that, that happens. It has it happened. Does happen. I, I, I mean, I, I agree with your general point. I mean, I'm not just a lot, but there's, there's been a lot of acts of violence. Yeah. But surprising little killing. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so well, so I, I suspect maybe they're not so committed to this as they think. You've heard me tell you the story about Paloma Verde CBD, the company out of San Antonio, Texas, owned and operated by Carlos and Vanessa Abelar. You've heard me tell you about how they went to the banks to get loans and accounts and were denied both because they were a, quote, marijuana-related business. I've told you that they persevered because both of their fathers suffered from a lifetime of chronic pain and both were helped by CBD. I've told you that Carlos and Vanessa pursued their project despite the government shutting down the businesses in San Antonio last spring, which meant shutting down their brand new gorgeous brick and mortar store that they had poured their heart and soul and a lot of money into. I've told you all that, but that's not why you're gonna buy their CBD, because you are very smart. You're gonna buy their CBD because they're giving you 25% off, seriously. This is the best deal you're gonna get on CBD, and a lot of you are gonna buy CBD, so just get it from Carlos and Vanessa and Paloma Verde. So, not only the 25% off all their products 
for an unregistered listener, you go to palomaverdestore.com and use the discount code RENEGADE, okay? 25% off everything. You get an additional 10% off if you just join their mailing list. So if you're this is the first time for you, you're probably gonna get 35% off your first order. Then on top of that, they put together my favorite, my three favorite Paloma Verde products into what's called the unregistered combo pack, otherwise known as the Thad Pack. And this is their, proud to say, best selling item. <laughs> what you get in the Thad Pack are their gummies, which are as good as any candy. Oh, that's a good shot right there. And you get 10 milligrams of CBD in each one. And I eat these like crazy. I love them, come in many fruit flavors. You get their soft gels, 25 milligrams per soft gel. And as I've said many times, I use between two and six of these per day, depending on how much Twitter is aggravating me. But my favorite, as I've said many times, is their high potency tincture. Uh, just before I started recording this, I put several drops under my tongue and uh, I'm feeling good. So go to palomaverdestore.com, use the discount code RENEGADE, change your body, feel better, change your life, and I thank you. All right, there's that book. Nice, love it. Um, and this is probably the maybe the least controversial one. Which one do you want to do next? <laughs> uh, still the adult child sex. That's always a big seller. Oh, yeah. Well, that, I, I, had, um, I had good friends who said, are you crazy? Do not write that book. Man, listen, you're talking to a guy who for 25 years has been making arguments more or less in defense of adult child sex in classrooms. Uh, and I don't, know if the, I don't know if it's the same argument as yours, but I even authored a piece in the Daily Beast in which I called into question the age of consent laws, oh, um, which is, yeah. you know, and I, I brought to sure. bear the arguments I was making in class. And I, let's, I'm going to see how they, whether they jibe or not. So sure. adult child sex, Steve, so you, that's, the, uh, that's just the dumbest thing you could possibly argue. Um, uh, if you're interested in a career, if you're interested in respectability, if you're interested in being, you know, invited to dinner parties. So yep. let's we'll start there. Like why on God's green earth are you as crazy as I am in, in taking on this argument? So it's funny you mentioned. So um, <laughs> I actually got interested in, 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 in a kind of a roundabout way. What I was interested in is whether or not an act is wrong because it's harmful. So I, I actually got interested in it for theoretical reasons. Right. Because um, this seems to be like a paradigm case. There's actually some meta studies which seem to suggest that in some cases, uh, at least with regard to um, adult males and um, underage uh, males, that it's not harmful or mm -hmm. if it is harmful, we can't decide whether the harm is due to the sex itself or the fact that society goes berserk over it. And so, one of the articles I was reading said, look, this is wrong. We don't need to know whether it's harmful. The empirical question of whether or not there's any long-term harm we could track on this is really beside the point. And I was kind of struck with a question. I thought, well, it's not obvious to me why that is. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, the standard kind of other argument is that it's a right infringement. And I wasn't sort of convinced by that argument. Mm -hmm. And also when it comes to hebophilia rather than sort of adult child sex, so sex with like young teens, it's not clear to me. I mean, look, there's at least some reason to believe that um, that, that individuals are, you know, designed by evolution to begin reproduction at that period. So if they're mm -hmm. designed by evolution to begin reproduction, it's not clear why it would be physically either harmful mm -hmm. um, or emotionally harmful. And so, th so there was kind of like three different explanations, none of which convinced me. One was that it was harmful. And I thought, well, there's at least some empirical, there's at least... A, a controversy whether that's empirically true. Mm -hmm. There's the right infringement case that we don't get, they, they can't give their valid consent and therefore it's wrong mm -hmm. in virtue of being a right infringement. And there's a view that it's exploitative, that even mm -hmm. if it's not harmful, yes. and even if it's not a right infringement, it's somehow an exploitation. Right. I've, I've heard all these, yes, okay. Right, so those right. are the three dominant arguments. None of these convince me. So the- Me neither. The, 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 the harm <laughs> argument, well there's, not, there's actual like, you know, empirical controversy over this. Sure, yeah. On the rights-based argument, I think, look, we, we make children do all sorts of things that Thank we don't you. want to do. Right? Thank you. you know, we make them go to, they go to church. We make them go to the temple. We tell them to go to school. They got to go to the dentist. They got to go to their, their sister's ballet recital. And, yeah. and we don't care what they say. And, and they want to do things we say no, right? They, right. they say, I want to stay up and watch 
you know, creature feature on WPIX until, you know, Thank two you. in the morning. <laughs> well, it's tough. That, that, that is all a child's life is, is coercion, right, that's right. is coercion by adults to make, and often to make the child do something for the adult's pleasure only. That's exactly right. Yeah. You say, yeah, you're, you're going to go to your great uncle's funeral, even though you want to go, and he right. was not in your interest. Right. So the rights-based argument's a little bit hard to follow. In addition, hmm. at least in some cases, certainly with regard to hebophilia and sort of underage sex. Um, what's, with, what's, the word, mid- what's the word about hebophilia? Hebophilia would be like kind of young, younger teens. Okay. You know, just statutory rape cases, right, where the person's under the age of, age of consent, which okay. actually, as, as you know, varies quite a bit between states. Indeed. And in those cases, the individuals seem to be willing, right? So it's not like you even have, you know, you, you sort of dragging some kicking and screaming into doing something they don't want to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The third thing about exploitation is really bizarre because exploitation mm-hmm. occurs when there's a uh, kind of a transaction and both sides benefit from it, but one side, usually the side, it, you, the, the side of the stronger bargaining position takes an unfair share of the transaction surplus. That is, they take the more than just share of the benefit of, of, the, of the, the transaction. Right. And you think, okay, well, even if that's true, one, um, I, it's never clear to me why exploitation is wrong, but even if that were not the right. case, right, because it's a mutually beneficial exactly. trade. Yep. Yep. But even if that were not the case, it wasn't clear to me, well, um, you know, I mean, wh- how do we know that the, that the underage, you know, the, the, the young teenager or the, the late pubescent child isn't gaining as much from this, especially if they're a willing participant? Mm. And even if they didn't gain as much, how do we know that there aren't another, uh, enough of other benefits, right? If someone, you had a tutor who's mm. tutoring them in, you know, literature or the violin, mm-hmm. why wouldn't the package of benefits be mm-hmm. such that they're gaining more than mm-hmm. their fair share of the transaction mm-hmm. surplus? So I thought, well, look, there are three different explanations. The first one's you know, in, in empirical controversy. And it's, a, it's an odd view that whether or not it's permissible depends on the outcome of these studies. Right. <laughs> the right. second view just seems to be a, a non-starter, right? We just don't, we don't think that children <laughs> have to give valid consent for pretty much anything we do to them, right. especially if they're willing participants. You know, you know we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't say, well, a child can't play kickball because they can't validly consent to it, even right. though they really want to play kickball. Right. And then last, exploitation. Again, I, I don't think exploitation is wrongful. I'm not exactly sure even what make something exploitative. Exactly. If there were, I'm not sure what makes it wrongful. And even if it were wrongful, it's not clear that it occurs in uh, most cases of adult child sex or even um, let alone all of the cases. Yep. Do you know? So that's, so that's what I thought. I looked into it. Um, I, the other thing I felt free to write it is because um, I don't have, I'm not a pedophile. So, um, and I don't engage in adult child sex. So I thought in some sense, look, I don't care if people attack me personally on it because it's not something that involves me directly. Mm-hmm. Whereas someone who is actually interested in this stuff, obviously they'd want to keep a low profile. They wouldn't want to argue for it. So in some sense, I'm free to make the argument in the sense that uh, whatever, I, you know, you can call me all the names you want. It doesn't mean that I, it doesn't the, diffuse my argument. The only time I've ever gotten a death threat really from something I've written was the piece in the, I wrote it in the Daily Beast about 12 years ago um, about Roman Polanski. I really have to read that. That sounds interesting. Yeah, real, it's a real short piece, but I, I come up with, a, it's, you and I, I think very much alike on this. You know, I kind of attack all those arguments. Uh, that are made. Yeah. I mean, I say, I say, come on, children are coerced all day, every day to do all sorts of stuff, including stuff that is purely for the adults gratification, which is also dangerous. Like, like playing tackle football. Right. Okay. How many right. boys, how many boys are coerced by their dads into playing tackle football when they really don't want to, which we now know causes serious brain damage. Right. 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 <clears throat> and there's, and need I go on? I mean, there's just time after t- you know, instance after instance of, of, of adults, coercing children to do things that they don't want to do. It's just nonstop coercion. It's, it's really a plantation. I mean, that's the family. Right. Is it not like it, it, there's no freedom in a family. Like, right. That, that's right. And there's also like oddities. So take statutory rape law. Now, of course the age of consent varies from some States, but take a state where um, the age of consent is 17 <laughs> or 18. And let's right. say there's a four year window. So you have a, a, a 23 year old has sex with a 16 year old. Mm-hmm. And you think, okay, well, that, that's a felony. The person's going to do, you know, real prison time for that. Yep. And you think, yeah, but if the 16-year-old had sex with another 16-year-old, that you think, okay, well, at least in some cases where they have Romeo and Juliet clauses, which, which right. require you to be in like a three or four-year window. You say, well, that's okay. I think, well, well, why is it harmful or right infringing or have some other wrong-making feature for a 16-year-old woman to have sex with a... 23 year old but it's not if she has sex with a a 17 year old like what mm-hmm. what happens in the six years 
<clears throat> that turns nearly identical sex into uh, from from perfectly um, yeah. you know you know outside the criminal law to something that's a serious felony. Yeah. Now now one of the arguments you get is well look overall the consequences are better if we have this law in place. Okay, I mean perhaps I mean I mean I'm, I'm not entirely sure this is the case, but one the burden should be on the people trying to criminalize it to show this is the case, mm -hmm. given how infrequently the stuff is prosecuted. It's not obvious to me that they could carry the burden. But in addition, we got to be a little careful about these sort of good consequences argument because there's lots of things that, at least I think we should protect, we should protect liberty even if it doesn't have the best results. So I'm, I'm kind of a liberty freak and I tend to think, look, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are, that are probably overall pretty harmful. Um, things, for example, like, uh, you know, um, eating a fast food, you know, or, um, drug use or mm -hmm. dropping out of high school or mm -hmm. you know things like that so um it's not clear to me that um we should criminalize these things even if they have overall worse results so consequences are not going to justify criminalization in these other cases it's not clear that merely because it produces bad consequences to allow the sex to occur does that mean we should criminalize it right so that's my concern yeah, no, that's great. And uh, to me, I always say, uh, so what is the magical thing that happens on the moment you turn 18? What is, why is, there's this magical, gigantic wall between 18 and after 18, where you're, I mean, this is a radical change. You are, you can have legal sex one minute, you can't have legal sex one minute, and the next you can, I, you know, it's utterly bizarre. But then, to me, also, the really devastating, just empirical case against it is, um, Americans are so sure we're right about this, you know, um, but look around the world. Look at, look at age of consent laws around the world. I sure. mean, you have, you have European countries and advanced industrial democracies that have age of consent laws that are 13, 14, and 15. In fact, that's the norm in Europe for those ages. That's interesting. We are much higher than almost all other countries. Um, they range all over the map, all over the world. From I think some countries have it at 12 even. Right. 12 to 24, you know. Right. So, and they range considerably with the U.S. too, between those who have like yeah. 16 and those at 18. That's right. The, the states that have Romeo and, and Juliet uh, laws and, and those that don't. Right. No, and also you look at human history, right? I mean, the, the, the notion that we have these, these statutory rape laws is, is a relatively new thing in human history. I mean, sure. you know, as, as you know much better than me, recent, is rel fairly recent development. Oh, yeah. Peder um, both pederasty and incest were... They may have been illegal in places, but the, the, the law wasn't really enforced, certainly through the Middle Ages. I mean, that's, that's pretty much, I think, the consensus is that there was incest that was pretty rampant and no one just talked about it. it just, there was no discourse about it. It was a non-issue until the modern era. Right. And on, on some accounts, some of these laws were really aimed at preventing rape. They yeah. weren't. They weren't. I mean, and also you have then these other exceptions in addition to the Romeo and Julia laws. You have the kind of marriage exceptions. Yep. So somehow... Yep. When you have marriage, the sex that would otherwise be a felony mm -hmm. becomes something that you can't prosecute, depending on the state. Which tells us that what we're really trying to do is we're trying to protect against emotional harm or against sort of unwanted pregnancy. It's not clear that the sex per se is the problem; it's the consequences. And and again, I may you know that might be I'm I'm not completely unsympathetic to the notion that certain things have such horrendous consequences in the aggregate that we want to criminalize them. Mm -hmm. But I think one, it's clear who should bear the burden of proof on that. And two, um, there's a certain price to be paid. I mean, every time you put someone in jail for years, there's a huge cost to the individual, let alone to society. Yeah. And you have to show that, you know, the cost benefit analysis supports this. There's a very slick, sophisticated <clears throat> postmodern argument, I guess, um, that says that the culture is what causes the harm in people. The cultural assumptions right. is, what, is what causes people to feel as if they've been harmed, which ends right. up feeling like actual harm, right? And we know psychosomatic illnesses, it's sure. real, it's real, okay? I've had them, I know, you know I don't deny it at all. Yeah. They're realness in that way, but there is no physical basis for it. Um, and, and there have been studies that have shown, I think there've been many studies that I think a majority of so-called victims of child sex abuse, basically, um, felt bad mostly by the fact about the fact that they enjoyed it. 
That's interesting. That yeah, there's a gu- huge amount of guilt about having enjoyed it or having wanted it in some way, right? right. Um, among many, which again, so that tells me that, what, I mean, society tells us 24 seven that this is the worst thing you can do. Right. right. This is the worst thing. I mean, being a Nazi is better than this. This is, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? I mean, what, yeah. are they, what, what do mass murderers do in prisons? They kill the pedophiles, right? Right, right. that's right. You know, yeah, they, the, they, that's right. The, the worst, the worst thing, the, the pedophiles are like morally below them. This is the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, right? I mean, right, right, and right. So, um, yeah, I, uh, it's, yeah, well, I, I, at the very least, we'd want to disentangle those effects, right? I mean, yeah, you, you might think that, um, so for a while, there were laws which prevented, in, in, you know, Loving v. Virginia until 19, I think it was 1967, mm-hmm. laws which prevented. Um, interracial marriage and, and in some cases interracial um, sex mm-hmm. and you might think look um, imagine we discovered that these things were harmful to the participants I don't exactly how we show that but imagine some long-term psychological study we'd want to know well is is the harm due to the fact that uh, these society disapproves of it or is it is there something kind of the way in which human beings are structured psychologically right and until we can disentangle those effects we don't know which is producing it that's right. So I think at the very least we could say, look, we need to know what's going, what's, what's causing the harm, if there is any harm. Right. And also in looking at harm, we want to, we want to separate out those individuals who are willing participants and those who are unwilling participants. Yep. Because it's, it's entirely unsurprising that unwilling, unwilling participants were harmed. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wasn't surprised. I mean, it's true for the adults. So it's, it's, it's entirely um, plausible that it would be very much true for underage individuals. Right. But the interesting cases with regard to willing participants, are those individuals harmed? Mm-hmm. And there, I think, look, I mean, again, there's a controversy. And at the very least, we'd want to know the answer to that. And then with regard to the individuals that are harmed, but were willing participants, we want to separate out, well, what's causing that? Is it the disapproval? Right. So, yeah, I mean. My other empirical argument is I just ask the audience, do you know of anyone who had an illegal relationship in this way? Do you know of anyone, right? It's, it's legion. I mean, I've known dozens and dozens of people who had re- illegal relationships when they were 15, 16, and the, and the per- other person was in their 20s. Right. Um, and especially, by the way, gay men. Uh, gay men, it's super common for the first sexual experience to be with a man. And I have talked to many, many gay men who have described those experiences as fantastic and wonderful, right? right. I and, mean, and, and from what I was talking to gay men who tell me that as well, and they, they all seem yeah. to say that, look, it, it allowed them to sort of discover yeah. their sexuality, become more comfortable with it. Right. But yeah, I mean, same thing with just in heterosexual cases. It even shows up in Law and Order SVU when um, mm-hmm. uh, Olivia, um, you know, Benson, she said, look, I, I had one of these relationships. I thought it was fantastic at the time. Oh, yeah? So yeah, yeah so I mean, um, you know, you know and, that, and given that she's SVU, you'd expect a much harder edged attitude. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, when, when even the anecdotes are, are mixed, I, yeah, I'm a little skeptical when you take away people's liberty about resting on anecdote. But right. to the extent that you do rest the anecdote, you should at least have a unified account of anecdotes. Do you have, um, and this is not my favorite question, so please feel free to just like kick this away. Sure. But like, do you, do you have um, ideas about what the law should be? So in general, so my, my first view is going to be the minimalist account, which is that um, it should be an empirically driven law. So we should, and, and that the burden is on those people who want to criminalize it. So one account is to say, look, um, at least into the middling, you know, teenage years, let's say, you know, 14 onward or so, that the burden is, is going to be on the, um, on the person who wants to criminalize it to show that there's, there's either real harm or there's a right infringement that's going on here. Okay. So that, the, you know, it's not, the idea is the default position, not criminalization, the default position is legalization. Okay. Uh, after that, I, I kind of go back and forth because... Um, about, sorry, you're talking about prepubescent and postpubescent? So, so here's pubescent, that's what I'm talking about pubescent first, right? Yeah, okay. And then I'll right. get to prepubescent next. Gotcha. So on the prepubescent case there, because um, again, a lot of prepubescent uh, sex with adults and prepubescent uh, children doesn't does involve intercourse. Involves mm-hmm. various forms of sexual contact, but not intercourse. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, I've, I've kind of mixed views. I mean, I have the strong suspicion <laughs> that this stuff is going to be harmful in the aggregate, that it's, it's sort of a dangerous road to go down. On the other hand, I have these other views, which is you can criminalize something um, unless, you, unless you can show that it really is harmful in the aggregate. And also the view that there's no direct wrong maker other than aggregate harm. 
And then the additional view that I'm not sure that harm is the great, a great test for what we want to criminalize because lots of our liberties might involve activities that are indeed harmful and we shouldn't, we, we, we shouldn't criminalize them. We still shouldn't criminalize them because of the value we place on liberty. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of undecided as to what to do with the, the sex between adults and prepubescent children. Okay. What, what, what's your take on this? Um, gosh, I, I don't see a reason for the laws. Um, I, th I see that they've done massive amounts of harm in this country. So you have about a million people on the sex offender registry forever. Right. And that, and that ranges from people who have, you know, tied children down and raped them to right. people who were 19 and had sex with their 17 year old girlfriend. Right, right. Uh, and everything and everything in between. And, sure. um, you know, I have many, many friends who began relationships when they were teenagers and they dated like their professors, right. you know, or their 30 year old math teachers in high school and then had a relationship for another three, four, five, six, ten 10 years. Uh, my ex-wife is <laughs> is now married to her ex professor. Sure. You know, I mean, she, you know, after me, she went back to, and he's tw 20 years old. Um, right. And they, and but um, so I don't you know, and it's also like. The cultural taboo, the stigma is so intense, as I said, it's the worst thing. You don't think we do enough policing of this on our own as a society? Wow. I mean, we, we you know, the, 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 ref, the cultural reflex is to, as I said, kill these people. I mean, wow. and that kind of does happen, you know, and there's a tremendous amount of policing going oh, on. And it's in, once you're on the registry, I mean, what happens to people is horrendous. Oh yeah. The horrendous. Stories are, are and, and I mean, you, you raise a really good point. And the other thing is we, at all times, rape is going to be severely punished. So it's not like we don't have a way to stop yeah. unwilling sex or, or yeah. in the case of, of teenagers, unconsented to sex. Right. So we have a severely, fairly severe mechanism by which to deal with that. Right. So I think you raise a good point. Um, so with the prepubescent children, the adults, as an overall policy, I, I kind of go back and forth. I, I'm very sympathetic to your approach. In terms of lowering the statutory rape, well, I think there's an excellent case for that. Oh, yeah. I mean, so I think a very strong case for that. But to be honest with you, I, I, when I discuss these things, and I normally don't discuss them because yeah, yeah. people just do not want to hear it. They don't want to discuss oh. it. They find it completely beyond the pale. Oh, yeah. Like you, I've gotten all sorts of kind of, um, well, not threats, but, you know, various threatening messages. At one point in time, my, my department secretary contacted the police because of the sort of messages that people were leaving on the phone for me. Oh, boy. And, and, um, yeah, I bet. Yeah, I mean, it's just, there's just no interest in discussing this and pursuing this whatsoever. And I think it's exactly what you're saying, that the, the, the background idea is, look, anyone doing this is a scumbag. And so who cares whether it's just or unjust? Right. And I think this is atrocious. I mean, you're just throwing away people's lives, like you said, doing enormous damage to people yes. without an adequate case for doing so. Yeah, and I think it's a very important issue. I, I, it's not, this is not just a couple of academic provocateurs, right, sitting on our ivory tower. I mean, we are that, but I think it's actually sure. very important. Um, I think it speaks to, for America, why we have such high age of consent laws relative to other countries speaks to our Puritanism. It speaks right. to the Puritanism of our culture. And it's foundational, right? Number one. And number two, it speaks to, I mean, Sigmund Freud had the big explanation for this, which I find quite persuasive, which is that civilization requires the taboo on incest because mm -hmm. civilization requires a hierarchy. And in the family, if everybody's having sex with everyone else, the hierarchy breaks down and therefore there's no more model for a civilization within the family. And therefore you then have wild savages being produced mm -hmm. out of those kinds of families, which, you know, I mean, if you look at the Middle Ages, when, as I said, incest was normal, um, you know, you can make a case for that. There was a lot of wild savage activity um, uncontrolled. So civilization in the modern era, Freud says, and Foucault does, says this to some extent as well, uh, civilization cracked down on that hard and first. That's the first mm -hmm. taboo, Freud said, the first thing that they had to crack down on. Because again, you know, the father needs to be the head of the family. And if he's, mm -hmm. and if he's having sex with his daughter, then who's who and where's where and what's what, right? Who's, yeah. And, you know, it's a, it's a speculative theory, but I think it's pretty, I, I'm persuaded by it. Um, but I'm well, certainly- in, in support of the Puritanism, I mean, we, we yeah. do criminalize plural marriage, for example. Yeah, right. Recently, we, we didn't allow for gay marriage. So, I mean, there, there's a number of um, policies. It's a little hard to see how they fit easily with a, a, a with a society that places primary a primary emphasis on liberty. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. And also um, places some sort of emphasis on evidence. I mean, what would be the evidence that you know um, plural marriage or gay marriage in some ways makes us worse off? Yeah, it, it's yeah. a little hard to see what the evidence is for it. Right. And, 
Yeah, and it would punish just countless, well, it has already punished countless people who did things that by anybody's lights were completely consensual, even if they were 16 or 17, because when they were, when that woman, usually it's a woman, turns 18, 19, 20, becomes a full-fledged adult, she still says, oh, there was nothing non-consensual about that. Right, that's right. So one of the things, yeah, when you see that the, the, you have what would, if this were to exist, you'd have retrospective consent. Yeah. Um, in addition, for a long time, they didn't prosecute it. So even if it was in the books, right. um, I think through the 70s, there, there were, it was rare that this was pro the statutory rape for example was, was prosecuted which tells you that people of my wanted my, might have wanted some symbolic statement against it mm -hmm. but they really didn't think that it was worth pursuing which suggests that they they don't they don't think it's a wrong making feature maybe it's one of the cases where you want to get on the books that you're expressing disapproval and then just not act on it whatsoever yeah i know you've written about pornography have you written about sex work because this is relevant right because i i i'm not working about sex written about sex work i've written about pornography right um and yeah that was another area which i i thought was i mean i thought it was fascinating and i'm i don't know do you want me to talk about that or do well, let me let me just say yeah well, i do but the my point there was that in sex work it's this is really relevant because of course Anybody under the age of 18 who sells sex, it is considered not just pr prostitution, it's considered sex slavery and trafficking. It's, right. it's just by, that's just by definition. You are going to prison for a long time if you ever right. are a pimp for a 17-year-old. Sure. Um, and, and the thing is, of course, that many, if not most, 16 and 17-year-old sex workers say that they're doing this because they want to do it or it's preferable to their op other options. And so right. they don't want to be punished and they shouldn't be punished. Um, so... Yeah, what's your take on pornography? Let's do this. You haven't have you written a book or just an article on this? I have a couple of articles, and it yeah. shows up in some of the books. Okay. So again, I mean, oddly enough, I I got in kind of a roundabout way, like I you know they get into these kind of um unpopular gritty issues, and sometimes I just enter for theoretical purposes. So violation pornography, which involves um, pornography in which there's some sort of um, either illegal or unjust sex. So that it, it, the, the actors appear to be reenacting a rape or right. one of the participants is underage, even though, you know, oftentimes a woman is not actually underage, but right. you pick someone who's young enough to look underage. And the question is, uh, this stuff is enormously popular. And it's not just enormously popular in pornography. It's enormously popular in people's fantasies. Mm -hmm. And one way you can see this is by just asking people, do you have rape fantasies? A surprisingly number of women have rape fantasies. Huge number, yep. yep. And, and also just look at romance novels, right? It's yes. surprisingly common that romance novels involve either involuntary sex or sort of quasi-voluntary sex. They involve, they involve women being taken. Being right. Take, being right. taken is the, is the term, yeah. Right. And, and so some of these experiments seem to have suggested, when they actually did, they actually did the polling results, things like that, they, they seem to suggest that um, women actually have rape fantasies. It's certainly the case that, that men yes. have rape fantasies. In fact, you can show that men are fairly turned on by graphic depictions of involuntary sex with women. Mm. So what I was curious is whether or not this, it's bad or wrong to watch this, because it looks like... <laughs> It looks like something inappropriate about it. I mean, you're enjoying mm -hmm. something which would normally be, a, you know, horrendously wrong. Right. Um, doesn't look like it's something that virtuous people would do. Right. And so it seems to be vicious, rather virtuous. And in that sense, it would probably be um, bad. There's an observation of whether it's wrong. I mean, is there a, there a wrong making feature? We tend to think, you know, if, you, if your teenage son were watching this, you'd say, hey, stop watching this stuff. You know, it's the <laughs> wrong thing to do. Right. So I was kind of in, and, and you know, you'd never at a party where someone says, hey, you know, I, um, you know, me and my wife have really good sex relations, but you know, when she's out of town on a business trip, I, I watch violation pornography. You, you just never, <laughs> it never happens. Yes, there's something, you know, really objectionable about this. Right. So I was curious as to whether this is the case. So we have seemed to get like a real divergence here in that incredibly popular in people's fantasies and what people pay for and what they read and what they watch. And yet there seems to be no defense of this whatsoever. So I first got into virtue. Is this a case where someone is doing something vicious? That is, you know, they're, they're not well designed. And so I needed a, what I thought was the best theory of virtue, which, which comes from a, a University of Toronto philosopher, um, Thomas Herka. And he says, look, um, you know, virtue is when you are in, um, enjoying those things which are good and hating those things which are bad and vice involves uh, enjoying those things which are bad or evil and, and hating the, the good. Mm -hmm. 
And it's not clear this is an enjoyment of an evil or enjoyment of a bad. Why? Because I think people's content is something like the following. They're thinking to themselves, were this action to occur, it'd be sexy. Not that it's right or good, but that it's, it's sexually arousing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not love of the uh, love of evil, it's mm -hmm. love of something that's neutral. And then there's an issue, well, what if you love something that's neutral? Is that itself vicious? Well, probably not. We love lots of things that are neutral. We watch adventure films all the time and, you know, mm -hmm. there's violence all over the place. Right? I was going to say, yeah, murder is just fine. We, we, we get off. We do. We get off on watching murder and sure. that's not a problem. Yeah, I mean, just look at, you know, Sylvester Sloan or, or Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. I mean, those are just loaded up with violence. And yeah. we, we don't think that's especially vicious to enjoy that. In fact, right. um, uh, with my nephew, I've been watching some of these films, you know, some of these classic Westerns and, and, and war movies. Yep. So we watch things like, you know, Platoon and Full Metal Jack and Apocalypse Now. There's yeah. a amount of violence in these, these shows. Oh, yeah. We don't think that enjoying the violence, whether it's embedded in the plot or not, is especially vicious. In fact, we think it has good aesthetic awareness to enjoy these things. Right. So I don't think it's vicious because it doesn't involve love of evil. It's, for us, it's not clear it's, it's evil at all because it's not a real event, right? It's, a, it's, it's right. merely an act out event. But right. even if you thought, well, it's, it's wrong to love something that would be evil were to obtain, it's not clear that's the thing. Our, our, our love of it seems to be more fine-grained. We seem to be enjoying it because it's arousing and sexy, not because it's an injustice. Yep. The other issue is, is there a wrong making feature? So even if it, leave aside whether it's vicious or virtuous, it's an issue with simply wrong making. And here it's really hard to see what's wrong making, right? It doesn't, there's no right infringement. Mm -hmm. um, it's not obviously harmful either in the individual case, it's, it's pleasurable in the individual case. So it's, you know, oftentimes it's, it's certainly not harmful if anything is beneficial. Um, in the aggregate, is it harmful? Again, here it's mixed. There's at least some data which suggests that um, it's not harmful. In fact, it reduces sexual violence. Other laboratory studies right. seem to suggest the, the, the opposite. So again, here mm -hmm. the data is okay. mixed. I kind of believe the former data more, but again, yeah. it's, it's kind of, it, it is mixed. Mm -hmm. um, but even there, it's not clear something's wrong if in the aggregate it's harmful. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example of this. Um, when you watch The Deer Hunter, mm. a major feature of it is Russian roulette. Mm -hmm. Now, it's been reported. I can't find an academic site for this. So I don't know if it's true, but it's but at least reported that when people, when every time they show this on a national network, that there are instances of Russian roulette. So, so really unnecessary deaths. So overall, showing this movie makes the world a worse place because the amount of pleasure people get from watching it does not outweigh the death of a few you know, people unnecessarily because people decide they're gonna try Russian roulette. Yeah. Um, I, again, I'm, I can't find an academic site where people report this. And I tend to think, well, look, this is not enough to, 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 to ban the movie or even tell the networks not to show it. Because we tend to think that um, liberty has its value. And that mm -hmm. one of the values is that we enjoy excellent art of which I think the deer hunter is an instance of it. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so I'm not even sure it's that harmful in the aggregate. And I'm not sure that even if it is harmful, that's enough to sh make it's wrongful. Again, if you're not producing harm, and if Jones is not producing harm when he watches it, it's unclear why the fact that, you know, when, when Smith and Anderson are producing harm by watching it, it's not clear that right. if Jones right. should watch it. But, um, it's yeah, so, so and then the third account is, well, some people think, well, it's wrong because it's vicious. Well, it just kicks us back to why is it vicious? <laughs> I mean, you know, you know we... Yeah. How is this any different than watching violent movies? Yeah, right. It's, it's an expression of desire that we now know is held by many, many people, probably a majority of people, right. but it is simply an expression of desire. Right. And do we want to make expressions of desire illicit? I think it's an excellent point. And right. this doesn't go into the moral argument, but I, I also think it's worth noting that this desire is probably at least in part genetic. And here's uh -huh. why we should think this. The, um, the kind of prevalence of rape sex is true across all human cultures. Mm -hmm. It's true across our uh, other great apes. Uh, human beings are, are apes. It's true with their cousins, you know, bonobos, chimpanzees, things like that. So um, given that, given sort of how widespread it is, it's likely that it has a genetic connection to it. Hmm. Again, this doesn't, affect, this doesn't make it 
um, doesn't affect its moral status. It doesn't make it more likely to be good or right just because it has a genetic linkage. I mean, it might be that, you know, stealing people's food has a genetic linkage. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't make it okay. Right. But what it, what it tells us is it's probably not this result of societal, um, you know, misogyny or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not, but, but again, even if it was that, you know, lots of sort of culturally based, um, tastes might might be right, and I'm not, I'm not sure that people would gen have a genetic taste for, you know, for, for for beer or for for hard hard spirits. But yeah, well, Freud said that repression is required by civilization, right? Repression of what he called the id, which is where all the desire for sex and violence is, and with that, there is no civilization according to him without repression. And I think he's completely correct about that. Uh, he ends up taking the side of civilization against the id, and I'd end up taking the side of the id against civilization. But I do think civilization, just uh, by definition, uh, must repress stuff like sexual desires, especially chaotic desires like that. So it's just an ongoing war. It's an ongoing war inside of us, right? Uh, between our desires and what the superego is telling us to do, you know, what, what civilization is telling us to do. Yeah. But um, the attempt to make the desire illicit or illegal um, is just an, it's a very sort of heavy handed attempt at repression. And what really needs to happen is if you're bothered by the fact that so many women and men harbor rape fantasies, then we need to have a discussion about that. I'm not even sure we need to have a discussion about that. But if that's if that's what bothers you, that's where you look to. You look. You got to look inside of people's minds and their psyches in very deep, dark places. By the way, and also, I'm not sure we want to do that. Instead, right. why, why don't we just let them watch some porn that re represents their desires? And it turns out, in places where porn is totally legal and wild and off the hook, they have much lower rates of rape. So like in Europe, right? And right. Although I'm always a little aware. I, I mean, the studies I was relying on were cases where they, um, where they, where they looked at either the time of violence and, and mm -hmm. the prevalence of, of this sort of pornography. Um, so that, that's, that's the sort of, you know, where, where I was looking at, or kind of changes in locations, like you said, which are a good way to look to see whether is it once you control for other factors. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think you raise a good point. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious about, um, your defense of the id over over the superego oh. in the sense that um i mean look if people just acted on the strongest desires there would be oh yeah widespread oh yeah uh, you know violence if nothing else and yeah, yeah, yeah. We, so, we, we, don't, we don't want that no no no. so i know yeah so i say that um in a highly developed highly civilized culture in which there is lots of repression and many many moral guardians who are very powerful and control all the major institutions like the modern united states and like modern europe and like japan and other places right yeah um, you know generally speaking i'm going to be on the side of what i call renegades people who sort of go against the, the dominant norms yeah. even when even when they're not such nice people like the mafia in the 1920s they they sold liquor when it was illegal but aren't we glad that they did right, right, right you know right, prostitutes right. in the 19th century like they made more much higher wages than all other women in the united states and from that they developed a tremendous amount of economic and political power are we glad that they yes we are, you know, i need to go on right. so um so those were all considered to be utterly chaotic id driven people at the time right, right. what they did was it's true they lived a they lived against the dominant norms simply by being themselves and, 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 and seeking out their own pleasures, right? But when they did that, the rest of us followed suit and said, oh yeah, drinking booze is fun and, and, and women having power and you know, the kind of sex that they're talking about is good and all the rest of it. So in a culture, in a society like here or Northern Europe, you know, where it's very organized and there are plenty of cops of all kinds, right? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to be on the side of people like Kim Kardashian and Paris Hilton and da da da, right? Right, so, right. So I see what you're saying. Yes. And, dr and drug dealers, you know, right. like I'm, I'm very much on the side of drug dealers because I think drugs should be legal, right? Right. Even though they're not good guys usually or often, right? Sure. Yes. So that's, but on the, but on the other side, right? Um, imagine if we have no one like that, if we have no renegades in our society, people all follow the rules, you know, I mean, it's, that's totalitarianism. I mean, that's, that's a place none of us, I hope none of us want to live in. Right. Right. So, but so, if I, but I was just, sorry, just to finish. So, so if I live in, though, if I live in a place where there is a very weak central authority, central state, all of that, and a weak sort of 
unifying culture and the garbage isn't getting picked up and crime is rampant. Oh, I'm going to be much more interested in cops, right? <laughs> so that's that's that but not, yeah, not no, it makes sense to me i, I just it's just yes. you and i come at this to the same conclusion but from different places totally um i, I guess i just think look i'm i'm not sure this defense of of id so much as defense of of liberty right or freedom i mean you just oh you yeah. know when you have um kind of less force people naturally gravitate towards satisfying others desires just just because of the way in which that can benefit them sure yeah i yeah i just um I just don't like puritanism. So I, you know, there's nothing good about it, I think. And so I, uh, I tend to always take the side of their enemies. Um, I, I, I have a certain sympathy with you, but, but my, my, I, I tend to think we can perhaps sidestep whether we like puritanism okay. or not, because one thing is just to have like communities which form, form their own norms and live however they seem fit. I mean, if people want to have very puritan sure. communities in, 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 in rural Montana, Knock yourself out. Sure. If people want to have a communes and, and, and free love and open marriage in a different part of Montana, may, maybe even like, you know, two towns over. <laughs> yeah. Great. I mean, why, in some sense, we can sort of sidestep saying, well, which, which do we prefer? Well, I mean, one answer is that, um, you know, regardless of what I individually prefer, what you individually prefer, what's best is what do people like. And it's good that they have oh. the ability to set up their own communities, set up their own norms, and use private property to, to allow for that. 100%. There's, there's no reason to have, you know, Puritans and uh, communes, you know, uh, free love communes have to agree. I mean, they just, right. they can, you know, strongly disagree and, and still yeah. trade with each other. Yeah. So political decentralization is what you're getting at, which I'm yes. all for. I'm, I'm 100% for that. Yeah, sure. Oh, if you want to have a communist uh, Puritan, you know, city on a hill, but you don't want to like impose it on me. As I as you said, knock yourself out. Yeah. I, I'm just interested in just putting forward the alternatives to American Puritanism and right. saying, "Hey, here's an offer, a way of, a way of thinking, and a way of being, and maybe hope, hopefully a way of living." Right? And if you like it, join me, and we'll form a we'll form we'll form our own community, which is actually what I'm doing. So you know, I mean, that's, that's yeah, I, I'm totally with you. All yeah, right, no, I think it's a great point. Cool, man. So listen, let's let's shit on veterans now. You. you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so um after the uh, after the adult child sex this is the one that gets the most um, yeah, violent sure. opposition people think of, of all things you are you are awesome. anyone we should be grateful to your awesome. veterans and so let me give you kind of a, a quick argument and then give you this a, a little more in-depth version great the quick argument is um compare veterans to farmers and they say okay well we owe a lot to veterans and they say well um you know if we didn't have veterans as a collection we wouldn't be free we'd be under the control of another country and but the same thing's true of farmers right if we didn't have farmers as a collection we we'd starve to death and you think okay well um all right well we didn't have this individual soldier or airman a sailor then we wouldn't be free well that's not true because people are, are replaceable and and even if they aren't replaceable you just have to pay enough and you can you can buy much fine replacements um, so it's not true with regard to individuals. It's not true with regard to individual farmers either. Then you say, well, the, um, the average military person is putting himself in danger more than the average farmer. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem with this is, one, it's not entirely clear that's true, at least for some branches of the military and mm -hmm. at various times. And this is certainly not, it's not clear that it's all true when you compare dangerous jobs like logging or oh, yeah. you know, some of the fishermen. Oh, yeah. So I mean, we don't think we should be grateful to them. No one thinks that we should have <laughs> holidays or at least express our gratitude, you know, say thank you to, to loggers or fishermen, you know, thank you for, <laughs> you know, serving our, our community. Right. Well, they certainly put themselves at risk and in some cases put themselves as much at risk as oh, yeah. do members of the military. But um, so the, it's kind of the, the kind of crude account is why, and, and also the other thing is the military, at least according to two studies, I think by the Rand Corporation, are, have, have fairly strong compensation packages. When you look at all the benefits, the salary levels, how soon they can take the retirement package, you know, the overall compensation is quite high. So even if they were putting themselves at risk, you might think, well, they're paid well to do so. So, you know, you had a, a job package. You could be a librarian, which has like lesser pay, but lower risk, or a sort of a higher pay, higher risk. And you think, okay, well, you chose which, you know, fit your preferences. Why should we be grateful when you chose this package rather than that package on the basis of it being in your interest? Mm. So, I mean, so the 
quick version is why, why be grateful to the military, not, not to farmers. Okay. The, the more general view is, um, the more kind of fundamental view is when should you be grateful to, to someone? Well, think about, you know, we should be grateful to our mothers. Why? Well, <laughs> our mothers sacrificed themselves for us. They went well and beyond the duty. They did that in order to benefit us, and they, in fact, benefited us, right? So they, um, they acted, their motivation was to benefit us. They, they went beyond the call of duty, and they, in fact, benefited from us. Mm -hmm. And it's unclear if veterans did these things, right? It's unclear if their motivation was to benefit us or mm. to get this package of benefits. There you go. Um, during combat, it's interesting what the studies show in terms of why uh, individuals perform under combat, it seems that they're fighting for the band of brothers. They're yes. not fighting for ideas. They're not fighting for people back home. They're fighting for the band of brothers. So at least during combat, it's not clear that they're, they're, they're motivated. Fighting for their, they're fighting for their buddy next to them in the fox. That's hole. exactly right. Yeah. Right. They're fighting for, the, for, right. for, their, for their brothers in arms. Yep. And um, do they in fact benefit from us? Well, I guess it depends on the war. It's, it's a little hard to see why is... we benefited from <laughs> a number of these wars. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, wars such as World War One. it's a little hard to see exactly how we benefited from World War I. Um, you know, Vietnam's kind of a giant controversy, but it's not obvious that we benefit from World War I. Certainly the sort of more recent wars, the, the Serbian War, the two Iraq wars, the Afghanistan war. They're all controversial. The war, I mean, yeah, the war in Libya. I even, would claim even, World war II, even World War II is controversial. I mean, yeah, I, I, actually, I actually think that is controversial as well. I, I, but, I'm, writing, um, I'm I, writing a book about that right now, actually. So. Right, uh, that's interesting because, uh, you know, you're my view on this is so outside the mainstream. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. even worse than adult child sex. Oh, yeah. But the, um, it's, it's kind of funny that. But so it's not clear they, in fact, benefited from us. They, it's not clear they intended to benefit us. And it's not clear they went above and beyond the call of duty. I mean, that's what the job entails, you know. Right. And the package of benefits also includes what the package of benefits looks like for a young man. So, for example, if you go to West Point, now this I can find no study on, but um, they report that one of the reasons you, you want to be, for example, attend West Point is to get you all these social benefits, right? Your, your dating and marriage prospects improve, your community holds you high in esteem, and that your, the equivalent job would not produce these benefits. Well, my view is that's part of the benefits package. I, I mean, why think then that because you chose benefit package A rather than benefit package B, we mm -hmm. should be grateful? One last reason that we don't, that it's probably not good to be grateful is that you can't quantify it, right? I mean, you might think, look, we want to know, um, we want to choose when to be grateful to someone. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't choose to be grateful to this individual. And um, so as a system, it's not clear that we want to use gratitude as a currency rather than cash or other benefits we cash so yeah so on the theory it's not clear that they're similar to our mother or, or sort of members of the military similar to our mother and i think in terms of what makes us grateful the answer is no and then the cruder example is what exactly separates someone from the military from a farmer mm -hmm. i mean to me well so first of all i hope you do separate conscripts from volunteers right that's very important to me okay so we say about, again, conscripts, we might want to feel bad for them and we might want to uh, think that we owe them compensation. Oh, yeah. But if they're, if they're slaves, it's, it's unclear why we should be grateful to slaves <laughs> so much as sorry for what we've done to them. For sure, yeah. And I think, I think the draft is, is atrocious. I mean, I know the Supreme Court's case saying that it's not involuntary servitude, but it, it sure as hell looks like it. Yeah, so you, oh, you call it slavery too. Yeah, I think it's slavery, yes. Good man. And um, yes. we're, we're so, very, it's very rare. Very few people say that. It's, um, it's a yeah. highly, and I don't get it at all. I don't understand the objection to that whatsoever. I, I, I don't understand how, how is it country, not slavery? How is it? Yeah, not I, I, I do not understand. I don't understand why a free country would want sort of, you know, involuntary members of the military. So, um, because I mean, look, pretty much any wealthy country can afford a military. What they can't afford is they can't afford to hire, hire people at low labor costs. Mm. So the issue is, are we going to shift costs from young men and women, usually young men, mm -hmm. um, shift costs from them onto the taxpayer, put the costs on them? It's not clear. There are two different ways of getting an adequate military. It's just a matter of who's going to bear the cost of it. Right. It's not clear that you can't get a good military so long as you just keep on increasing the wages until you get the people that you want. Yeah, I guess I was. Uh, I guess I was taking a slightly different take. I was. I was talking about not so much um, gratitude, um, but blame. <laughs> I blame volunteers for volunteering for wars that I think actually made the world worse for me. 
in some cases, actually less safe for me, like the wars of the Middle East, right? Right. Um, I don't think it made the world better. For, I think it made the world worse for me for John McCain to go bomb civilian uh, peasants in Vietnam in the 1960s, right? Sure. Um, you know, it did all sorts of things to that country, a country I might want to visit. And I also don't want to have my name attached to the deaths of those people, which unfortunately yeah. it is because the United States doesn't allow me to choose whether or not to be a citizen of the United States. And so when they drop those bombs with the American flags on them, unfortunately, you know, I am associated in the minds of the people, the victims with those bombs. Yeah. Um, yeah and so I, so, for, but of course, conscripts is an entirely different story. I mean, to me, right. you know, they're the worst victims, I think, basically in our history. And um, yeah, I do think it's slavery. And, but, the, but more to the point, I, I hold veterans who volunteer for these wars responsible for those wars. And if they were not a good war, they're, they're to blame. I mean, the war wouldn't happen if they hadn't volunteered in many cases, you know? So it's- right. Well, so- hold some, some culpability here? Yeah, I, I said, no, I actually have a little more mixed view than you do on Vietnam. It's kind of interesting. I mean, I don't know if you want to diverge there, but I, I do think that these um, communist countries prove themselves to be quite the slaughtering grounds. So I'm, I'm not- No doubt. Uh, and and there, I think the concern about dominoes uh, at the time was reasonable. And, and, uh, and mm. so I'm not sure I agree with the Vietnam War, but I, I'm not, okay. I'm, I have a little more mixed views than you do, um, both because of the concern about dominoes and also because how just- how, you know, the absolute level of destruction and, and death sure. that communist regimes brought about. Sure. But, um, yeah, I, so I, I hear what you're saying about blame. I, um, that is a good point. I mean, so if you have involuntary, even that doesn't completely absolve someone of blame. For example, if you're put, so, so imagine someone is kind of an old case, the uh, Irish Republican Army says they're going to kneecap someone if they don't drive these individuals uh, somewhere and leave us at the actual facts. Imagine the driver knows they're going to engage in a drive-by shooting. Right. So he's going to be crippled if they don't or disabled if they don't, if he doesn't do it, you might think he's still blameworthy or not fully blameworthy. That has an excuse or at least a partial justification mm -hmm. in virtue of the violence that he's facing, but still not a fully sufficient justification. Right. And you might also think with regard to some of these voluntary participants, if they really they don't know or they, they to assess what they're doing or they just get it wrong that they're not fully blameworthy even if they are blameworthy. Um, so I'll give you an example. So do you think that, um, so, so the, take the Libyan war or the Serbian war where Congress refused to fund the war. So it wasn't just that there was no declaration of war. They, they didn't even agree to fund it. Right. You might think that's a violation of the constitution and that a member of the military takes an oath to uh, protect and defend the constitution. Mm. Uh, do you think the members of the military who participate in that were, were oath breakers? Um, and that they, they've, they've in some sense earned our contempt or at least considerably less respect because they didn't live up to their oath? I guess or so. Or do you think that they're not blameworthy because their interpretation of the Constitution, while incorrect, is not obviously wrong? I mean, I guess technically they're oath breakers, although I'm just not concerned because I don't care about the Constitution. Um, in the way that a lot of people do. I mean, that's not, or I should say, that's not my concern. My concern is simply that um, I'm opposed to these wars and these people chose to fight them. So, um, you know, I don't, yeah. I, but yeah, I guess they're technically oath breakers. I, I, I guess I have some sympathy. No, I don't. For volunteers, sorry, you get all the blame, buddy. I don't get it. Like if you, if you're, if you get all the, the praise and the credit right? For protecting right. our country and our freedoms and our rights and blah, blah, blah. Well, you get the blame if it goes wrong, if you volunteered. You know, um, the Iraqi children who are dead are dead in, in part because of you and your participation in that war. Same with the Vietnamese, same with the Japanese, and same with all of them. Um, right. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to get around that, but, you know, not the slaves, the ones who actually, like John McCain, he volunteered. He knew what he was doing. He knew that he would be dropping bombs on civilians. And that's what he did. And he was shot down. And I'm glad he was. <laughs> sure. so, so, I mean, here's my question then. Um, I'm glad he was shot down. I mean, yeah. Because there was, a, there was a war going on. And I would rather the Vietnamese have won that war. Right. So, so I'm, just, I'm just curious about this. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm, I'm curious about this. Yeah. So... Um, 
I mean, given the history of starvation and slaughter in places like the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. uh, Maoist China, mm -hmm. uh, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, yep. why not? And again, I'm, like I said, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. And I do think there is a declaration of war requirement in the Constitution. I know not everyone holds it, but that, that's my view. Right. So I think these wars are all unconstitutional in their Oh, the yeah. World. Oh, sure. But, but why not think that there was legitimate concern? It was borne out that the North Vietnamese were going to be slaughterers. Mm -hmm. um, again, it might not be a business, it might have declared war. Mm -hmm. um, the South Vietnamese regime might have been corrupt. Right. But, I mean, given that it's a reasonable prediction that the North Vietnamese would slaughter hundreds of thousands of innocent people, mm -hmm. and in fact, on some accounts, they did do so. Sure. Why think that that's not, um, it's at least a murky case in terms of justice, leaving aside the legality, it's mm -hmm. at least a murky case of, of justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you don't like what the communists did, which I, I certainly don't, and you didn't mention Cambodia, which is the worst of them all, right? Yeah, yeah I was going to ask you about that next, actually. But yeah, I mean, the, all of them, Stalin, Mao, China, Vietnam, you know, yeah, every one of them I detest. You know, they were murderous, they were mass murderous regimes. Uh, here's what I'm arguing in the book I'm writing, um, which is that, the diffusion of American popular culture, especially sort of lowbrow popular culture across the world over the last century and a half, mm. has done more to subvert authoritarian regimes like communist regimes, like fascism in Italy and Germany, like communism in the Soviet Union, than anything the, the 101st Airborne could ever do. So that military, military interventions actually hardens, it tends to harden the regime that's being attacked and it gives the regime, and like Kim, uh, like in North Korea, the fact that we are surrounding that country with our military gives the dictators of that country, you know, great reason, great excuse to militarize and regiment their population and to sure. impose all sorts of controls on them. Um, but but when jazz and the blues and Jack and and um, and all these people are coming into in the Germany and Berlin and gays in the 1920s and, and early 30s they were subverting every minute of every day, everything that constitutes national socialism. So that's why Hitler and the Nazis, that was one of the first things they did was they wanted to cut off all the imports of like popular entertainment from especially America. Right. And because most Germans were way more interested in Louis Armstrong than they were in Adolf Hitler, as a matter right. of fact. So, so I, and I, I'm sort of like everything you're saying, but I'm curious with like the Khmer Rouge, right? Or the Pol Pot you know, regime, yeah. right? We had a small group of leaders that they killed roughly 2 million people. Um, yeah. killed it in a short time and in a relatively direct manner. W would you be opposed to sending in, assuming there was a declaration of war, which there wasn't, uh, the B-52s to take out that small regime? No, because that's what started it. It was B-52s who started that. The, the B-52s. Oh, all right, fair enough. But I mean, once, once they started, I, I absolutely agree with you on that, but, I but mean, once they, they're in place, would you then send in the B-52s to take them out? No, I mean, I don't know. I don't think so, no. Uh, Nixon carpet bombed Cambodia. You know, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying. Before, just, before, before, and that sort of set the stage for the, for the killing fields, the famous killing fields of Cambodia. So, you know, bombing tends not to have produced good results in my review. And, and <laughs> in my then, view. Yeah, no, I think it's a great point. So, and in return to the veterans, so one thing you might say is that, look, before we're grateful to veterans, we, we should actually look into whether one of two things is true. Did their, their course of action, was, was it reasonably expected to benefit us? And separately, did it benefit us? And if yeah. the answer is no on both, right. and if they're not motivated to benefit us, right. it doesn't look like a case for gratitude. Yeah. I mean, let even me, if someone yeah. does benefit us, if they don't do it in order to benefit us, it's unclear why we yeah. should be grateful. I mean, um, I mean, look, lots of people have benefited from Frank Sinatra's music. I, 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 right. I like Sinatra's music and, and um, you know, obviously hundreds of millions of people like, um, but, um, but does that mean we should be grateful to Frank Sinatra? Yeah. I, I'm, right. I'm not sure why. I mean, that's a case where he did benefit us. I'm not sure he was motivated to benefit from us. I'm not, mm. I don't exactly know what motivated Frank Sinatra. But, um, you mean, collect you, know, he, you mean collective gratitude? Like I'm, I'm individually grateful for Frank Sinatra's in existence, sort of in a like Buddhist way. You know, I'm just grateful that he exists in my life and it made my life better. And I appreciate that. But as an individual, you're talking about collective sort of coercive. No, I mean, gratitude. I mean, like, I mean, so you can be individually gra grateful. It's question is whether you should be individually grateful. Okay. So does it take someone who, I mean, imagine someone has this. Um, well, what's, what's the problem with being individually grateful for a great artist existing? Well, the, the concern is that if the gratitude doesn't have a proper justification, then it seems to me mistaken, even if it doesn't harm anyone. 
Okay. So imagine that you are grateful to um, someone whose behavior is just, you know, flagrantly unjust so that you, mm-hmm. for whatever reason, you're, you're grateful to Typhoid Mary because she, she, you know, <laughs> led you to write this fantastic screenplay, which made you very rich and famous. Right. Um, I mean, you could be pleased that she existed and, and sort of glad that she existed. I'm not sure why you'd be grateful to her, though. I mean, is that really, mm. I mean, did she really aim to benefit you or did she try to benefit you? Yeah. I, again, maybe it's not irrational to have attitudes that are systematically mistaken, but they are mistaken nonetheless. And to the extent that these attitudes have a truth condition, they seem to be false. Okay. So it's about, is it about the fact that I, I don't know Frank Sinatra or Typhoid Mary or who are a veteran. It, it, well, it's not that. I, it's that they don't meet the conditions of gratitude. Well, yeah. Not because similar they, to your mother. Because they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't have me in mind. That's right. They didn't have you in mind. Yeah, that's what they I mean. Try to benefit either people like you or, you know, right. collection, which includes because we you. Don't know, because we don't know each other. That's, I'm right. saying the basis of your critique here, right? Right, right. That's okay. right. Yeah. Um, but, but, and, and in some cases, yeah. is it okay to be angry at someone who didn't, it's, do uh, anything to us. I mean, could you have a, a secondary anger? Uh, perhaps, but it's not clear that you can have gratitude for, you know, if A benefits B, it's not clear that you can be grateful on behalf of B. Gratitude seems to be something that's tied to the individual. Yeah, this is sort of reminding me um, of like sports fans, right? Having these uh, this feeling of um, not just loyalty, but like familial association with their team, right? So they'll say, right. we when they refer to the Buffalo Bills, even though they've never set foot on a football field, right? That's right, yep. That's, yeah. and, um, and so that's just silly. And, you know, and also they express, express gratitude when they, the team does something good, right. even though the team has no idea they exist, basically. Right, and, or, or when a player retires, right? They, 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 they yeah. show up with gratitude. They say, look, I'm, I'm this grateful for all the that's right. enjoyment that you've given me, even if the player so did it solely either to gain money and fame or to benefit their their fellow players or because they just believe in the excellence of the sport, right? Yeah. If they didn't try to benefit the fans, it's a little, or at least it's not a, not a, a strong motivation for them. Right. You know, and, and you can see this kind of, so a significant number of, of people who go to West Point leave after their first tour. Uh-huh. Now, my guess is if you really increase the package, they wouldn't leave, which shows that a, a significant feature of the decision-making is self-interest. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mm-hmm. But if they're acting from a largely or at least significantly self-interested motivation, it's a little unclear why we should be grateful. Now, take the case of of you and Frank Sinatra. (laughs) Um, Look, you can be pleased that Frank Sinatra exists, and you might think that Frank Sinatra has benefited you, but but it's unclear why you would be grateful to Frank Sinatra. Okay, I get it. Any any more than you'd be grateful to Typhoid Mary Mary if you're writing a book about her. So the appropriate response is to be pleased, not grateful. Yeah. Okay. To you. Okay. Yeah. Or, or just happy that Frank Sinatra exists and, you know, yeah. the music that he did. I, I think, okay. So I think this is, uh, again, politically important, mm-hmm. um, especially when people, especially in politics, right? I mean, meaning formal politics, like electoral. Sure. Politics, yes. Right. So it's, you know, people merging, merging their identities with the Buffalo Bills is one thing. Mm-hmm. When they merge their identities with the head of state, or, yes. or with one of the major political parties that yes. is at the head of the largest superpower in the history of the world, mm-hmm. we're in real danger, or, or anywhere. I mean, that is the root of all authoritarian politics. That is the root of fascism, communism, all of it, is the merger of you, the individual, and your identity with the nation state represented by the head of state. So this is why, you know, when people do this in football or baseball or basketball, I'm annoyed. I'm not screaming at them, but I do want to like point out that if you keep acting this way, behaving this way and thinking about political figures, this way, which they inevitably do, mm-hmm. we are um, headed toward a regimented, essentially totalitarian society in which there's a cult of personality around the head of state. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, so it's a big, it's not, it's not an, again, it's not an academic quibble here to me. This is important. I, I mean, I guess I think, um, so could you have, could you identify with a political party or a leader and still believe strongly in individual rights and say, look, I, I believe in this individual or this party, but to the extent that they start trampling on people's rights, I'll dump them like a hot potato, drop them like a hot potato. 
I mean, if um, I, I'm not, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure it's an impossible position conceptually. Well, I mean, maybe it's empirically difficult to make that move, but I'm not sure it's. So, in other words, when once you do that with the nation state, right? You're yeah. you're, you're you're basically giving them carte blanche. You're you're allowing them. You're giving them permission to do things to you, right? You're and you're because you're saying, well, they're that's they are me and I am them, and so whatever they need, I will do, whether you know, right. including marching off to war in a foreign land that I've never heard of. Yes. So I, right. I think that's a good point. I, I, I wonder though, um, whether you could identify with the group, and I'm not saying we do this, but whether you could identify a group in virtue of its role in either producing good results or in protecting people's rights. So identify them because they're the leading defender of our rights or because they're the leading oh, yeah. defender of the efficient policy. If I'm convinced that once they take office, they will dismantle the office, <laughs> then I wouldn't mind identifying with them. But I, you know, no politician I've ever known of has done that, right? Uh, not really. And they want to, they want to take over, you know, the state power with all of its violence. State state power is yes. about it's the mon monopoly on violence, and right. that's, that's right. what it's all about. Is about the cops and the army. Right? Yes. At the end of the day, that's what it is, right? So. Right, right. Um, and they're also interested in keeping me orderly. They want me, that's their primary interest, me, Thad Russell, they want me to be orderly and law abiding, right? Yes. And not be critical of the government, not be critical of American institutions, not be critical of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and our great heroes and our late great presidents, right? That's what they want. And that's what they get when they find a patriot. They get someone yes. who's not, yeah, so... That's interesting. Yeah, I, I guess. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not. I think you, you, you make a really good point. I, I'm just. I'm just not entirely sure that you couldn't. Your identification couldn't be in part ideas based. That I identify with leader X or country sure. Y or party Z, in virtue of the fact that well, they're promoting these ideas. No, identifying with ideas is just fine. Right, right. But, I, but I'm wondering if you can sort of run these things together, like, or, or one is an instrument to the other. I identify with this instrument as a way of bringing about these ideas. Again, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just, I'm just kind of you. putting forth the idea that yeah. some identification could be instrumental. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean so there have been, so obviously, there have been candidates for president who I agreed with much more than other candidates. Right. But then I just sort of saw them as, as again, sort of tools. But I would never, I would never sort of put their face on my T-shirt, and I wouldn't put their name on my bumper sticker, and I wouldn't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and I wouldn't, and I wouldn't call them by their first name like a lot of people do, which sure. really turns my stomach. You know, when people call <laughs> politicians by their first names, my parents right. do that. Uh, <laughs> it's, it wasn't Biden and Harris who won; it was Joe and Kamala who won. Steve, <laughs> right. if you're wondering. All right, uh, this has been super fun. I love this so much. All right. We've got one more. We got the big one, your latest book, uh, total collapse. Love that. Yes. <laughs> love the so article. this book, and hey, wait, wait, let, me, let me give it, hold on. So it's called, it's called total collapse, the case against morality and responsibility. When I saw that, I almost had an orgasm. I'm just being honest with you. <laughs> so, uh, now I will say, um, and this is the book I know best of yours. Mm -hmm. It is, it's a complicated argument that you make. And I, there's a, a major piece of it that I struggle with, which is about free will. But you, you just lay it out now and then we'll, and then we'll uh, see if we can flesh it out for our lay, our lay audience and, and myself. Yeah, so, so I'll make two claims. One is um, that the way in which you think morality works, it does not work. And probably the best explanation is that there is mo no morality and that there's also no responsibility. So let me, let me take the responsibility first. Okay. So we often think that, that individuals are morally responsible. And by that, what we mean roughly, is that they're the sort of individuals that can be bra uh, praised or blamed in a correct manner. I mean, you can you know, praise or blame your dog or the cabinet at the door which bangs your head, but it's incorrect. But the idea is that, th 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 there's, that people can be correctly praised or blamed because they warrant it. They, right. The problem is it's a little hard to see what, is that, what it is that makes someone morally responsible. Now, there are largely two candidates in the literature and sort of variance in this, but basically two candidates. One is that someone makes a choice, and in virtue of making a choice, they're morally responsible. That is, they're going to be 
praiseworthy or blameworthy or, or have a neutral level, neither, you know, zero level of, of praiseworthiness or blameworthiness. So there's a choice theory, and then there's kind of a, a character theory that your, your psychology, or more specifically your psychology at a time, makes you praiseworthy or blameworthy. Okay. The problem is that neither explanation seems to be intuitively correct. Take the choice. If you're responsible for your choice, but you're not responsible for the psychology which brought it about, then it's a little hard to see why you could be responsible based on the choice alone. Mm -hmm. So for example, if Patty Hearst really were brainwashed, I, I don't think she was as a Sorry, scientist. some people don't know who Patty Hearst is. Oh, so, oh so Patty Hearst was a, um, a woman who was kidnapped in the, I think it was the early 70s. Yes by a Marxist revolutionary group called the Symbionese Liberation Army. Yeah. In, in my hometown. She was, she was kidnapped in Berkeley when I was growing up there. Yeah, sorry. Oh, is that right? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, she, and she's, sorry, she's an heiress of the, of the Hearst newspaper fortune family. That's right. That's right, yes. Her. That's her. And they kept her locked in a closet for 15, 51 days, where supposedly they, they beat her, they sleep deprived her, and on her account, they raped her. Um, mm -hmm. And so then she seemed to be a willing participant in their revolutionary activities, including right. things like robbing banks. And ro she robbed a bank famously, was captured on the video camera and with right. wearing the beret and, po and also posing in, with a gun in front of the Symbionese Liber Liberation Army and, and logo. Right, so, right. Yeah. And, right. and she, she, she tried to help her members escape. And even yeah. when like, the police tried to rescue her, you know, not right. knowing who she was, she never said, hey, I am Patty Harris. Right. So the standard account is that she's brainwashed. Now, mm -hmm leave aside whether, whether she actually was brainwashed, whether brainwashing is even possible. If she were brainwashed, the fact that she made a choice would not make her more responsible because she's not responsible for the psychology which led to that choice, even if it didn't determine it or dictate it. Mm -hmm. Same thing, if God were to create someone um, from nothing, right? um, you don't have to be religious told this, but if there were a God and he were to create someone from nothing, so and like a split second later the person were to act, so they would have a fully formed psychology, which they neither chose nor controlled, and they would act on it. Does not seem that individual is responsible for that choice. Hang on now, because they're not responsible for the psychology that led to it. Sorry, yeah, that part you lose me on. How are they not? How are we not responsible for our own psychology? So, well, I'll get to that in a second. But I want to do the choice first. Sure. So, imagine God created someone with a complete psychology, right? So, imagine mm -hmm. you know the person is normally a completely egoist; they only act on their self-interest, right? Except in this narrow case, which which didn't apply in. So, and the person as a result, let's say it's Frankenstein's monster, kills a small child right after sudden creation. We don't think, well, the Frankenstein's monster would not be responsible. Why? Because he didn't control or didn't choose a psychology. Mm -hmm. And his choice flowed from his psychology, leaving aside whether it was dictative. Okay. Right. So, so it doesn't even be responsible on the basis of choice. But the same thing is true with psychology. If you didn't choose your psychology, it's unclear why you would be responsible for it. Similarly, if Patty Hearst was brainwashed uh, because she has this, this psychology, it's not clear that that makes her responsible because she didn't choose it. Uh, okay. Same thing if Frankenstein's monster was created all at once and then, you know, split second after creation has a psychology, that doesn't seem to make him responsible. Again, because he didn't choose a control psychology. Well, if the basis of responsibility is not a choice and if it's not your psychology, there doesn't seem to be any other basis, right? The only other option is just to stack them up and say combinations of choice and, and, and psychology or combinations of psychology and choice do it. But, wait, but if neither one by itself makes you responsible, it's unclear why stacking them up would make them responsible. But hang on. So your examples are Dr. Frankenstein creating the psychology of the monster and the Symbionese Liberation Army creating the psychology of Patty Hearst, in which yes. case, so you're just stipulating, right, that, they're, that she was brainwashed. So if you stipulate that, that's yes. fine. I get that. So neither one in that case um, is responsible for their own psychology, but yes. that's not most people, right? So, uh, absolutely. Okay. But, okay. But the idea is that what, what makes you responsible has to be something, right? It has to be your choice or your psychology because those there's just a feedback loop, right? You exercise mm -hmm. choice, you change your psychology. Based on your change psychology, you make further choices. Based on your choices, you have a further change in psychology. So this is a feedback loop. But it's unclear why cycling through this again and again and again makes you responsible if neither one makes you responsible. That but, is, hmm. if A doesn't make you responsible and B doesn't make you responsible, it's unclear why the combination of them would make you responsible. Uh, now, okay. you're right. We do have this feedback loop. I mean, we're not like Frankenstein's monster. We choose our psychology to some degree. 
Okay. And we're not like uh, Patty Hearst in that, um, you know, our choices do flow from our psychology and not a psychology that someone externally imposed on us, mm -hmm. at least to that greater degree. So, um, but the idea is if you, you ask yourself what it is that is the foundation of responsibility, what it is that's the basic thing that makes you responsible, it seems there's two options and those, neither one is sufficient to make you responsible. So, so if you choose your own psychology and then you make a choice to do something bad, I'm, I'm still not getting the argument. Why are you not then responsible? Well, because ask yourself, what is it that would make you responsible? Was it the fact that you chose your psychology or was it the fact that your choice flowed from your psychology? Okay. Oh, okay. So if it's not the first choice, and by hypothesis, not, right? Because that, that, that seems to flow from psychology you didn't choose. Let's just assume it's your first choice. Okay. So you're not responsible for that. But if you're not responsible for that choice, why would you be responsible for the, the, the psychology that flowed from it? Okay. Right? Because, of course, okay. that psychology is, you know, you're not responsible for the choice. So how is it? A choice for which you're not responsible uh, can lead you to be responsible for a psychology. Okay. I guess. Okay. But, yeah, but if you're not responsible for the psychology, why would you be responsible for the choice that flowed from it? Okay. So the idea is that we never, we never sort of break into the system. We never get an, a, something that makes you responsible. Hmm. So let me give a related argument. It's not my argument, but this is a related argument. It's from yeah. a professor. Um, at, was at Oxford now, I think he's at CUNY, Galen Strawson. And his argument, again, similar to mine, but different, start, has two basic premises. One premise is you're responsible for what you do. So what you do depends on who you are. So what you do depends on who you are. Mm -hmm. It seems to be correct, right? The choices that you make depend on your psychology. And the second claim is no one is responsible for who he is. And the reason for that, Strawson claims, is that you're not self-created. But I think just another way to see it is we, you, didn't, you didn't choose your psychology. If you did, that's just going to kick the, you know, the problem back one step. Right. So Strawson's view rests on two premises. You know, what you do depends on who you are and no one's responsible for who you are. My account is more direct. It just says, look, what is it that makes you responsible? I think there are two plausible candidates, a choice and a psychology. Neither one by itself is sufficient. And if we stack them together in various combinations, you know, combinations of, you know, choice psychology or psychology choice or mm -hmm. vast sequences of them, you know, it's kind of like the, the old slogan, you know, I'm, I'm losing money on each sale, but I'm making up in volume. Okay. Well, if we don't add, a, add responsibility into the system, then long sequences of events or states are not going to be, um, are not going to allow an individual to be responsible. So are you, are you attacking, you're, you're, you're attacking the concept of free will. Am I right? Yeah, so, so I actually don't, I, I mean, I think it's a separate issue. I don't think we really care about free will. Okay. Um, I think what we care about is moral responsibility, right? So free right. will matters, I think, only to the degree that makes us morally responsible. And look, I mean, I don't know whether we have free will or not. I, I suspect not. But, but whether we do or not, I, hmm. you know, if we have free will, if it doesn't make us morally responsible, why should we care? Hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it could be that, you know, that lions and jaguars have free will. I mean, how, how is that relevant? So it's funny that you were expressing concern about my renegades taking over society, yet you make a whole uh, book argument uh, against uh, social responsibility, don't you? Isn't that what this yeah, is? Yeah, I guess any responsibility. Yeah, so I, I, right. That's how it works. So, and, and then the, the case against morality then is, is, is even more damaging, right? So, yeah. it, so the idea against morality is that there's only kind of a couple of bases uh, for what makes things right or wrong. Most standard account of rights, right? So we think, okay, people have rights. Mm -hmm. And this is just, and usually there's two justifications of rights, right? People have rights because either they're morally responsible and, um, you know, rights protect, give us space, elbow room to exercise their responsibility, which obviously mm -hmm. a problem for not responsible, or they protect people's interests. Okay. The problem with um, both theories is that rights are not going to do the work that we want them to do if they protect autonomy or interest. And the way you can see that is that certain activities um, are in our interest or not in our interest and are in our interest and not. They, they sort of, you know, turn on, turn off. We don't think right, rights work that way. It might be the case that if I um, I don't smoke, but if I, I smoked a cigarette at this time, I would enjoy it so I'd get net benefit. But if I did it later, 
you know, the, the, the possibility for addiction would, would, inc would be worse than my enjoyment. So that's not my interest, but it is my interest. We don't think rights turn on and off like that. Right. We also don't think when people have conflicting interests, that whoever has stronger interests wins out. So if someone has a greater interest in my stereo than I do, and they, you know, so they come into the house to take my stereo, we don't think they have a right to it just because they have a greater interest. And right. yet if interests justify rights, it's hard to see how that, why that would not be true. Hmm. Now, some people say, well, it's not the individual interest, it's the collection's interest. Well, one, there's all sorts of bizarre results on that, right? It tells us that if enough people are interested in something, then they have a right to it, regardless of how mm -hmm. just obviously unjust it is, right? So if enough people, you know, get their kicks out of watching subgroup victimized by some horrendous violence, they have a right to it because yeah. it would maximize overall interest. Yeah. And, and the same thing, the same game can be played with, with autonomy. Yeah. Uh, rights are religious thinking. It's, these are religious beliefs. It's, you know, if you, you go to Thomas Jefferson and, you know, it's like, well, where do these rights come from? Oh, well, they come from the creator. Oh, end of discussion. You know, oh, well, and they get a little more sophisticated in the 19th century. And they say, oh, well, they actually come from nature. Oh, really? Where, where, which blade of grass or cloud in the sky does it say that, you know, we have a right to free speech or whatever? Right, right, that's right. These are, these are inventions. They're social constructs, obviously. Um, some of them I like and some of, them I, some of them I don't. But it's so hilarious to me when people talk about them as if they're God-given. People who are secular people. You right. Know, right. It, secular thinkers who then they talk as if it's either come derived from nature or God as if, huh? Yeah, show me that. Where's the theorem? Where's the proof of this? You sure, can't even sure. begin to prove that. Yeah, and, and even, like I said, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, and it just, it's hard to see how this justificational element works. I mean, yeah. so people think you can waive rights, but, you know, if, if, if rights were really fundamental, if they protected choice or autonomy, then how could the same thing both protect the right and protect your ability to waive it? Um, but again, it's just, it's hard to see how, whether you focus on individual cases, you know, my interest at this time or a population's interest over time, the population's interest over time has problems, uh, really bizarre. This one problem, it's, the objection wasn't tied to this, but I, but I think you can use it for it, use it for it. So if the interests of humanity are sort of promoted or, you know, sort of put for, promoted or set back by individuals having this right, then whether I should have a right now depends on what's true about the ancient Egyptians, right? Mm -hmm. Whether this would have benefited or harmed them. Yep. It's but it's kind of odd to say like whether or not I have this right depends on facts about ancient Egyptians. Right. So they're eternal. It's eternal. These are eternal uh, truth claims, right? It's eternal. Rights are rights everywhere and always forever. Right. That's right. And if they're going to do the work that we want them to, they're going to have to function like that. They're yeah, of course. Have to be true across. Yeah, across space, all time, space and across, space and time, space yeah, and time. across all yeah. possible worlds. Exactly. Yeah. So, but the right. other justifications don't don't seem to work any better. Um, if consequentialism is true, that first of all, if you're not morally responsible, it's unclear why anything is right or wrong. Explain consequentialism. So, or consequentialism just says that. Um, so, people often have heard this utilitarianism. It just says that the ends justify the means. Yep. That is. Whether or not your action is right depends on whether or not it brings about the best results. Right. If so it does, it's, so it's, it's the right thing to do. It, it's, a, it's amoral, right? Well, it's 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 a, the rightness depends on whether or not you're making the world a better place or a worse place. Right. But it, okay, I guess okay. In that case, it is in that sense, it is more moralistic. That's true, right? Right. So it is the theory of morality. But, I mean, so there's a number of problems with it. One problem with it is that. Look, if we're not morally responsible, then we're not the sort of things that do right or wrong actions. I mean, no one says that. Um, so if a, if a gecko eats a praying mantis, we don't say, well, that, that gecko did the right thing or wrong thing. They're not the sort of things that do right or wrong actions. Right. But if we're not morally responsible, in some sense, we're similar to a gecko, despite our sophisticated thinking. We're not moral agents because moral agents have responsibility. Mm -hmm. What's more, if determinism is true, we don't know whether or not it's true. But if it is true, so that you know, given what came before us and given the laws of nature, we couldn't have acted differently. It's a little hard to say, well, you could have made the world a better place when in fact you could not have, right? Yeah. Given that everything's determined. And then lastly, and this objection doesn't come from me, it comes from a philosopher named Stephen Bolter. It's a little hard to see when you perform an action at one time, let's say it's um, 2010, how that can be right or wrong based on what happens in 2020. I yeah. mean, yeah. the action no longer exists in 2020. So yeah. how could that... Um, is the problem backtrack in time to make that action right or wrong. Yeah. 
So the idea is that um, it doesn't seem that an action is right in virtue of its respecting rights or infringing on rights. It doesn't seem that a, a, an action is right or wrong, depending on whether it achieves best results or not. Um, kind of, and, and then sort of more specific ideas, which are central to morality, we can't really defend. Notion of proportionality, you can use mm -hmm. only so much force in punishing someone for self-defense. It's very hard to come out with an equation with this. I claim you can't do it, but at the very least, it's very difficult. So I just think, look, I mean, we're, we're, we end up with these two horrendous results, right? <laughs> One, and they're strong. I mean, I think things go haywire, and they're completely inconsistent with everything I said earlier in the interview. So if you're saying, well, haven't you, haven't you just contradicted everything you said? The answer is yes, and to my <laughs> eternal discredit. <laughs> so, um, one, it, it seems that people are not morally responsible because we can't identify what makes someone morally responsible. Okay. It seems that actions are not right or wrong because there's no um, thing, no thing which makes them right or wrong. Right. right? No the basis. Right infringement. The basis for that. Or, yeah. Yeah. Or a, or a achieving good or bad consequences. Um, and. So um, we're left with this very counterintuitive result that there's no morality and that there's no moral responsibility. And yet, right. if we believe those things, we lose most of our reasons for action. I mean, our, hmm. our daily worldview is, worldview is filled with what are called reactive attitudes, attitudes which mm -hmm. presuppose, presuppose responsibility, right? We get angry at people, we're grateful, we're proud, we're disappointed, we feel ashamed of ourselves. All these attitudes presuppose responsibility. Mm. In saying that we support this policy, but not that, right? We support um, an isolationist rather than an interventionist foreign policy, right? We support, you know, more freedom rather than less freedom in terms of social regulation of our lives. We're making morally moral claims, particularly claims about rightness or wrongness. Once we lose rightness or wrongness, those sorts of claims are not just, I mean, I mean they're flat out false. They're not just we don't just reinterpret them in a way which makes them true. Because when we say, for example, we should have an isolation rather than intervention for foreign policy, mm -hmm. what we're saying is there are right and wrong actions, and this is one of the wrong actions. Not me. So what I say is interventionist foreign policies, as I said earlier, makes the world worse for me, and often it makes it less safe for me and the people I care about. And that's why I oppose interventions abroad. That, so that's a, that's a politics of self-interest. I'm not making a moral claim there at all. But but you don't normally. I mean, like, like if, if you um, if something were in your interest, you still might be opposed to, right? You still might be opposed to. Um, let, let's say that uh, you were allowed to, for whatever reason, you had some exemption. You're allowed to, you know, steal or batter whoever you want. You know, oh, okay. You know, you were given like a license to behave. You know, like, right. like you know, you know the, you know what, you know the, the Sun King in France. Like, yeah. Um, my guess is you would think, look, I, I really ought not to do that, or I desire not to do that. Well, mm. then the question is, why would you desire not to do something which would make your life go better? Well, I mean, if it involves hurting someone, um, then I risk blowback from them, you know, so it's just, it's a cost benefit analysis for me. You know, again, it's not a moral claim. It's not, I wouldn't choose to not hurt someone based on morality. I would choose to not hurt someone based on the kind of relationship I want to have with them. Okay. Right. And so, so if I go around hitting my neighbors and this goes for people I don't even know, this goes for strangers too. If I go around hitting people who I don't know, my life is definitely going to take a turn for the worse, even if right. I don't go to jail for it. I mean, they're just, people will hate me and that's not a good place to live in. Right. Right. So that's why so that's a politics of self-interest. But, but note that your, um, but note that your language might be a little bit misleading because if you were to translate okay. your statements into desires, okay. it, it would, would, would seem to lose the kind of conversational force that it normally has. If you say, um, mm. I, I desire that we have an isolation of foreign policy, or I, I, I desire that you not, um, sorry, you know, steal my <laughs> things. <laughs> I mean, I think it, I think it's actually been pretty effective. I mean, would you, would you kind of imagine someone who had, who had really atrocious desires? Imagine someone said, look, I, I desire to take your things. Oh, I mean, well then it's you say, well, look, would you, would you say, um, would you say the person is wrong or mistaken or would you say, look, you just, you just, um, you just, their desire does not align with your desire. Correct. The latter. And I would say, good luck trying to steal my stuff. Cause I have guns. Oh, fair enough. I mean, yeah. <laughs> what you're saying. Um, no, no, as, really. a, as a resident of New York city, I'm, I'm sure yeah. you're pretty well, well protected, I mean, but, but, but this, I'm, but this is the world, you know, I mean, this is the way, right. There's conflict in the world and people do want to do stuff to me. Individuals, governments, all organizations want to do stuff 
take stuff from me, you know? Um, and then it's just a fight. I just want to be clear about what they want, right? Once I know what they want, then I'll, then I erect the defenses. <laughs> you sure. Know? I mean, so, I mean, instead, instead, so of, you're instead, making of, excellent point. instead of moralizing against them. What so, is so it? Excellent. So the yeah. idea is that you could translate, I, I think a translator, or at least you should think in just in terms of desires and that people don't actually disagree on morale or if, if they, they, they either don't disagree on morality or if they do, they're just all saying false things. So there's no, there's not a meaningful disagreement. They're both, disagreeing false things yeah that's kind of an interesting take on things um hmm. i wonder if if it undercuts our reasons for action in the sense that imagine something's in your interest and you desire it mm -hmm. it's unclear if that provides a reason for action just because something makes your life go better unless you presuppose that you should do those things which make your life go better it's unclear why you have a reason to act on it oh because they feel good because they make, I mean, I don't know, there's multiple reasons, you know, they make me yeah, feel I, good. I guess, I guess I wonder if that's a reason or if that's just an empirical statement. I mean, why, oh. why is it better that you feel good? Oh. It's better for you, but why yeah. is it better? Again, these are all socially constructed uh, rationales. You know, this is all like socially constructed desires. Everything, everything I'm saying is social construction. Um, everything I'm saying is an invention and a fiction. It's just that they're ones I prefer. That's all. I just prefer yeah. them over others. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying, and I, I look, it sounds like your system is consistent. I'm not sure it captures a lot of what we want to say, but it seems to be perfectly consistent. Good. Again, I'm a little bit worried that it presupposes reasons, but maybe not, because I'm a little bit worried that what you're presupposing there are reasons to do things which make your life go better or make you happier, and that there aren't such reasons. But in addition, um, just as a side, I'm, I'm not actually sure that's socially constructed because it at least seems to be okay. like a, like quasi moral sense in chimpanzees uh, so i'm not sure to agree to which i don't think that matters but i'm yeah. clear to me that's not at least in part genetic yeah um we but don't... no i mean I, so what you're saying would make sense what i'm saying but it it, it, would, it would lose a lot of what you and i do for a living we argue we argue for things right we argue for things in history we argue things for philosophy yeah. and we tend to think or we're, we're watching or listening to arguments we say well you know a's argument is better than b's argument but why think that? I mean, we're presupposing things like consistency and support by evidence are good, but why are they good unless you desire them, right? You might not desire consistency. Yeah. You might yeah. not desire that, that some statement be supported by evidence. So yeah. unless it's going to be desire all the way down, which it might well be. Yes, it is. It doesn't seem to capture a lot of what we want to do, what we do professionally. It's, I want it to be desire all the way down. I want my decisions to be made based on my desire, my individual desire, not on, on morality not on the dictates of the culture at large. Right. Right. Um, so, so on your view, um, which I'm not screaming on, but, but on your view, it, it's just really, it, it, there's nothing wrong with victimizing others, nothing wrong whatsoever, but it's an empirical fact that some people's desire is going to be frustrated if you do that. I, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, just moral claims in general, I just find farcical or just, I just think they're silly. I mean, cause they're based on nothing. I mean, they're just fiction. So, I mean, you know, they, they hold no more weight than me desiring, you know, a, a glass of beer at night. I mean, it's, these are desires, they're fictions. I mean, so yeah, I don't, there's no problem with it. I mean, the politics of desire and the politics of self-interest are actually really popular. I have found, I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think it hurts your cause at all. In fact, I am not, let me say this really clearly. I've never read Ayn Rand and I, and a lot of what I have read, I don't like. Uh -huh. um, but, but I do think this is very similar. This piece of my idea, my, this piece of my worldview, I think is similar to hers, which is, I think she preached the, 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 the politics of self-interest as well. Um, is what right. I so, so, so in other words, it's not that unusual a position. And Ayn Rand has been awfully popular. So it's just hugely popular. Actually, was a big influence on me. When I was, when I was, oh, okay, but I'm not a but I'm not a Randy, and I just like no, no, no. I hear what you're saying, and and, and like, like I said, I mean, but but I mean, she definitely has like a, a moral structure to her, which which you and I are rejecting. Oh, definitely. I, the, much of Rand I don't like, but that piece of it, you know, the self interested right. piece is that's right perfect sense and it's been very popular but but no no one other thing and that is your desire need not be tied to your self-interest you could desire that your um that your interest be frustrated right you, you could desire your life go poorly yeah. and yeah. that would be that would be a yeah. uh you know kind of a a relevant feature but why are you worried about that like if this is why are you worried about what i choose like what's that why is that an issue for you what, what's the concern well the concern is just to understand um whether or not 
the way in which you look at the world is consistent with the sort of skepticism that you and I are putting forth. Okay. Whether my world. So my concern is, the concern is that you and I presuppose reasons, Mm, mm. not, not just on a daily basis, which we certainly do, but even in the way in which we think about things Mm -hmm. that simply are inconsistent with our um, view about the, the theory of morality, the fundamental theory of morality. Interesting. So, an example is on the view that everything's desire based, you might have various contradictions come into place that you desire your life go poorly, and it's unclear what you do with that, right? So, if you mm. desire your life go poorly, then if it goes poorly, it goes well because the desire is satisfied. If it goes well, it goes poorly because the desire is frustrated. Um, mm-hmm. And these sorts of paradoxes, um, I think, present real problems for the desire based views in terms of what, you know, kind of what satisfies the desires. Now, someone might say, well, these are just these self-referential paradoxes. It's not a special problem. It's just, it's just instance of the liar paradox. You know, like, um, this sentence is a lie applied to my desires. Um, I tend to think the problem goes deeper than that, but, it, but, it, but at least it's a concern. That okay. That paradox is a result. And, and then again, the other concern is just that um, I just think a lot of what we think and how we talk, particularly in our, our professional um, roles, probably can't be translated desires, but perhaps I'm wrong. Mm. Oh, I'm pretty sure it can be. But um, this is something I'm definitely going to think about. You've made me think about this more than anyone ever has. And I'm, oh, I, definitely will, I would definitely chew on this. And we will talk about it the next time. I got another question for you that's just totally off topic here. Sure, maybe. no, I'm really enjoying this. Absolutely. Or, at least, or at least it's not directly. So I'm um, curious about you. You know, uh, hey, man, y- you and I both have chosen to say basically the most controversial things you can say in our world. You know, I mean, for God's sake defending right. you know, adult child sex and trouncing veterans and saying that no one, <laughs> no one has responsibility. Or, um, right. Do you have any theories as to why you've been attracted to making arguments like that? Yeah, so I, I, I've thought about that a bit. I, I didn't actually start <laughs> out with these sorts of views. You know, I, I, yeah. um, <laughs> I kind of started out with fairly conventional views. In my dissertation, I argued for retributivism. What's that? Um, the, the idea that we should punish people because only because they deserve it. Oh, that is, we should give people their just desserts when we punish them. Okay. And in fact, uh, my brother and I ran a marathon, and, and in the back it said "just desserts" um, <laughs> because I'd written my dissertation on it. And uh, so, I, on the other hand, look, I mean, it seems to me that if you, ha- you know, if you have this many views, which sort of, you know, go across the grain, you know, uh-huh. th- there's got to be some sort of um, you know, just you're just fighting the current. What but is it? What is it in you? Where did? Why you? I, I I guess. Well, part of it I think if you do applied ethics, I mean, it's just part of the field, right? You've got to follow the logic where it is. Okay. But two, I, I just think that. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess I guess I'm not sure what it is. I mean, I don't see myself as an especially oppositional person. So uh, I, I kind of thought of myself as a, a fairly good teammate. So, um, <laughs> so oh, I'm a great teammate. Um, I mean, I'm divorced, so I guess I'm partially opposite. <laughs> I'm divorced too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, but yeah, I don't see myself as especially oppositional. I, I guess I just think, look, um, certain things they, they just the arguments just, just. I mean, it's almost aesthetic. They just rub me the wrong way. I mean, yeah. I just you know, I mean, take the abortion case, right? You, you look at those religious views about the afterlife, and then you look at their views yeah. about. Um, you know, not killing fetuses to guarantee their, their, their trip to heaven. And it bothers me. Like, it's just like, well, why yeah. wouldn't you guarantee the trip to heaven? And I call my brother. I'm pretty close to my brother. And I say, well, what do you think? And he, he says, yeah, it bothers me too. I'm like, all right, well, at least two of us think this. Logical, and, uh, logical inconsistency in, in people yeah. who are sanctimonious about it. That's what that, bothers me. That's an excellent That's point. it. <laughs> that, that could well be just the aesthetic <laughs> displeasure of it. Absolutely. Ooh, it's the sanctimony um, of people who are illogical in their thinking. It drives me bananas. That's it. Yeah, that might be it. And maybe, I'm, I'm, I mean, again, I, I don't particularly think I'm especially like, irritable. But when yeah. you when you like, go to events, they say, all right, we all should take the time to thank veterans. I'm thinking, well, well lots of people sacrifice this audience in all sorts of ways, including all the mothers, including you know, the, the farmers. Why, why are we singling these individuals out? Uh-huh. And so it just, it just, I, I guess it just rubs me the wrong way. So, and then some of the things like responsibility, there, there, I'm kind of just drag kicking and screaming, right? I do, I, I desperately want to believe in responsibility. In fact, like I said, you know, whatever, seventy percent of what we discussed today becomes utterly false and meaningless once you lose responsibility and morality. 
So I don't want to lose either one. <laughs> but the argument seemed to work. I, I, yeah. you know, I take them on the road. I, you know, I go to conferences. I, I run yeah. up. I have, I have really smart friends who benefit me enormously. Mm. I run up by them, see what they have to say. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if it survives the conference, it survives my friends. Uh, and my brother, I think, well. Um, <laughs> Keep going. Runs my, runs my brother my sister. I'm like, I'm like, look, I mean, the argument looks good to me. What can I do? I mean, <laughs> looks like a good argument. I, again, the fact that I don't want it to be true is beside the point. <laughs> you know, the best it. I can determine it is true. Yeah, man. And I'm guessing, so I'm wondering about you. Do you have, um, so how did you arrive at so many um, kind of unpopular views? Like, I was just thinking this the other day. I, I have basically gone through about a two decade period of just radical disillusionment with everything I was raised to believe. I mean, I, my whole worldview, my attitude about things, everything from my parents to Christmas to socialism has all like turned upside down in the last 20 years. And of course, in politics, just I've just gone through this whole revolution, which again, it's just, it's disillusionment. I, I was born into a church. And, you know, I'm an apostate now. It's, it's exactly the same kind of thing, right? Where all of these things were just premises that were never questioned, you know, basic premises, right? And I'm talking about sort of the left liberal world. Yes, yes. And hardcore left in particular, in my case. And um, I just started to see one after the other, after the other not make sense, you know, either be in, internally contradictory or, you know, contradictory in other ways or just, or, or being the opposite of what they claim to be purport to be like they claim often left-wing politics often claims to be and this is true for conservative politics too uh for freedom and, and liberty when in fact they're not at all they're con for conformity and control and social engineering and making people you know not get abortions and all the rest of it right, right, right. so i mean it's um and yeah i i i do have a i do have an eye for contradictions and arguments yes yes mm -hmm. very it's very annoying i mean i am sure to deal with me you know i'm always looking for the for the contradictions and arguments but, but is it worth the price or you find that just that's how your mind works you can't avoid it well i, I mean, mean in some I've, sense you know, <laughs> swimming, swimming against the current is uh, you know I, it makes things harder than it has to be i've um i've received quite a bit of punishment and tremendous rewards for it both Definitely a lot of both. So I don't know. I, I guess I'm, I guess I'm somebody you. It's exactly true for me as well. Yeah, um, right. I, I don't think it's helped my career. On the other hand, that's how my mind thinks. I've had enormous amounts of, you know, very pleasing conversations and friendships, yeah. which involve these discussion and these ideas. So there, there's been so definitely definite benefits, but definite costs as well. But overall, I just think, look, that's that's the way I kind of enjoy thinking, and I, I don't. So you know, I'm not sure I'd want to cut deals to make a um, to to swim with the current. You know, Steve, I run a I, I run a university. You know, uh, it's called Renegade University, and we actually pay people better than adjuncts are paid at most universities. Um, wow. all, all you have to do to make that kind of money is be a good teacher and and say interesting things. I would love for you to teach something for us. Uh, you would be amazing, and people would love it. No, so. I, I would definitely consider it. And I, I certainly be, in addition, I'll be more than glad to give, you know, lectures for free. I mean, I, like I said, I, cool. I yeah, really yeah. enjoy this and it's really my pleasure to. Do, awesome. You know, now we'll get you paid. We'll get you paid. You're worth it. You are, you are amazing. This has been. For you as well. This is the most fun I've ever had talking to a philosophy professor by far. This is <laughs> I've really enjoyed it as well. It was a fantastic interview and I've, 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 in, I've enjoyed it from, from, from beginning to the end. So. Awesome, man. Well, and it's also, it's very, it's interesting how similar we are. I mean, there are, there's wild. not a lot of people on these issues it's who are wild. not like, you know, and either we, outraged or just, you know, want to distance themselves from it. I know. And we came at it from very different places. Like I don't, it's, it's wild that we ended up at the same, same uh, conclusions on a lot of these things, but right. all right, man, I'm going to let you go. This has been incredible. Thank you so much. And you will hear from me again because we're going to do stuff. And, and like I said, I, I've enjoyed this incredibly. If you want me to do another interview, I'd be, I'd be more than glad to do so. Awesome. Enjoy this anytime. And, and you know, I got ideas for you. Cool, man. Right. Thank, thank you, Steve. You. Right, thank you. Bye-bye. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To join the new Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. To join the new Unregistered Underground, the supporting listeners group for the podcast, go to unregisteredunderground.com. Thanks for listening.